Hey, uh, welcome everyone. Another lovely Saturday here. Uh, long weekend in Canada. So happy family day to anyone there and to everyone else listening. Always appreciate you joining in. <clears throat> kind of a rebound, rebound week here. Um, after some pain in the markets for us oil, oil sector investors. Um, so a bit more of a positive note. And I think it's a great time to have a macro outlook. It's been three months, I think, to the day. And kind of a great time to re reset uh, as to everything that's gone on. Not, not really much has changed, I think, on a, on a global supply demand perspective, but a little update, I think I was getting lots of messages regarding the macro. There was nothing uh, recent put out. So uh, here we are. Uh, before we start, again, for anyone on the Twitter space that wants to join for the Zoom call and the visuals, whitetundra.ca, the website, scroll to the bottom under events. There's the uh, Zoom link over there. Both will be recorded. So both the Twitter space and the Zoom are recorded. They'll be posted shortly after. I have been having trouble posting on Squarespace uh, where I host the website. So most likely it'll be just on YouTube for now and I'll try and get it into the hosting platform uh, over time. They changed up the way their drag and drop system works and you can't put files in a certain place. So uh, anyway. Um, and some other things before I start, I'm not an investment advisor, so everything I say today is my opinion. It's my perspective on the markets based on the data that I'm going to be presenting. I try and back up every statement that I make with hard data. Uh, so that'll be in this presentation. And I do also have a mailing list. So for anyone looking for the Zoom link invites and the files for the valuation sessions and whatnot, uh, please DM me or email me. I've got quite a few people on there now, so I'm not sure if it's sending to everyone, but I hope it is. And um, I can only take questions on the Zoom just because of the way the audio recording works with Twitter spaces. So if you do have questions, please leave them for the Q&A session at the end. Uh, depending on how long this goes, we might have a little break, kind of hour and a half or two hours in. We'll play it by ear. And, and go from there. Um, yeah, other than that, I think we'll, we'll kind of just get right into it. So for anyone that's attended these before, you know they're very, very long. Uh, they can be quite long and detailed. Uh, so I'm not covering everything today, just kind of the inventory and the, the main supply demand side of things. The rest of the information hasn't changed. So if you're looking for information on other countries that are not mentioned here today, please have a look at the April 30th uh, macro outlook. I did add in the YouTube uh, contents or whatever you wanna call it at the bottom there where you can scroll to individual sections based on the timestamp. So hopefully that makes things a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, we'll get started. And I also wanted to talk about US shale in this one specifically because I'm noticing things that are a complete different to maybe what other people are saying. And also what I think is very, very important going forward. A lot of the world still expects US shale to provide that million barrels a day of growth or even half a million barrels a day of growth year after year after year. I'm not just talking about 2022, I'm talking into the future. And there's some serious concern regarding this kind of going forward. And I'll kind of put my thesis out there and the rest will be uh, as the weeks go along, as the data go, goes along. Uh, we'll kind of verify these things as we go. So um, we'll talk about pricing, inventories, uh, demand and supply. Pricing. Obviously, what we get for our equities, for the commodity, very important. On the macro side, there's only three things that we really need to know. Inventories, demand, and supply. If we have a good understanding of these three things, you can make a pretty good judgment on the oil market going forward. You can see what are the swing producers, what are the swing demand areas, where can inventories be 
drained in the short term area, aka the SPRs and extra you know inventory sitting around. So the three things that I focus on and basically all all that really needs to be known uh, in my opinion. So we go back to WTI, it's definitely dropped from the 120 range that we had got to two or three times um, in the last three months, but we're still holding above hundred dollars, you know, roughly. They've been able to knock down WTI. It was again above hundred dollars on Friday before closing a little bit lower. But the point of the matter is, despite all the talk, all the narrative, everyone and their dog literally trying to crash the price of oil with every single narrative they can think of, it's still today $98.30. So that should kind of tell you something about, about what's going on here. And that's with the SPR release and other things I'll talk about here as I go. And this is a five-year high. We're looking, you know, still, still pretty good in the upper end of our range for the five years. And that's extremely important because at these prices, between $50 to $60, these companies basically do nothing. They, they don't really make money. They don't really pay back debt. They're basically covering their interest. They're uninvestable as a investment thesis, unless you see something happening on the other end, they basically do nothing. But as the price goes up, every $10 above 50 or 60, whatever number you wanna use, basically go straight to profit. So when the price of oil like this goes up 60%, 80%, the profit margins end up going up three, 400%. And this is a very important concept to understand if you're new to oil investing, because it's not just a linear downward and it's not just linear upward. There's a inbuilt leverage to the price of oil that's built into these equities. Same thing for natural gas. We're sitting at the upper end of our five-year range. We had the Freeport outage here. You can kind of see it's, it's clearly obvious. And the rocket back up on our pricing. Same thing. A lot of these producers, their, their operating cost is between a dollar, two dollars an MCF. So at these ranges, they basically did nothing. They just sat around, uh, you know, chilling and now they're finally making money and the money that, that they're making has been an exponential rise compared to kind of the more of a linear rise in the, in the price of, of natural gas. Um, but again, we are sitting at very, very good areas in commodity pricing. For those who just started investing in 2020, in 2021, in 2022, you, you're getting frustrated with the lack of movement or what's happening to these equities. They're not doubling in a week. This has been a basically a renaissance for these companies after a long, long, long time. So I think we need to keep our expectations within check. As long as the commodity prices are constructive, these companies are making tons of cash compared to where they were. And a little bit of patience uh, can go a long way. Again, this is not investment advice. This is the way I look at things. So when I say we, I'm more so discussing my opinion on these things. So that's the US pricing. Canadian pricing, we have uh, Canadian condensate. So the stuff that comes out of the Montney, the Duvernay, the growth formations, some of the names you're familiar with, Arc Resources, uh, Tourmaline, uh, Crew Energy, uh, Whitecap, et cetera. Uh, some of them are selling condensate. And you see it's trading pretty much in line with WTI. There is a higher discount recently and kind of various reasons for that, whether it's turnaround activity in the oil sands, whether it's just some more condensate supply slash NGLs on the market. But basically it trades roughly where WTI does. So one thing about Canadian oil, a lot of people lump it in as to just, it's all heavy. And that's definitely not the case. A lot of your you know, producers, the, the, the ENPs, the, the Shaley, unconventional, even the conventional ENPs are getting different pricing. So keep that in mind. It could be upwards of 15 to $20 a barrel difference 
which again is all profit, the way these companies are run. So looking very good, still above our five year range here. So solid performance here. Um, Western Canadian Select, this is your oil sands production. So the Synovus, Suncor, CNRL, Imperials of the world, $77.28, top of our five year range. You know, we, we hit this absolutely crazy time here earlier this year, we were trading at over $100 uh, for, for WCS, basically not really that sustainable. And then we had the SPR release come in, which affected pricing a little bit. So we're at $77 US. So why do I mention that? Because we were at roughly this range in US dollars a barrel in 2010 to 2014, 77 to 80. We had spikes to 90 and then, and then dropped down to 60. But the average was roughly 77, uh, somewhere in there. That's where we are today, roughly. However, when we look at the exchange rates, back in the 2010 to 2014 days, the exchange rate was one to one. One US dollar was one Canadian dollar. So 77 WCS meant 77 US WCS meant 77 Canadian WCS. Today, it's a completely different phenomenon. So we're at about 1.27 Canadian dollars per US dollar. So 77 WCS US ends up being roughly $100 Canadian uh, per barrel. So when we look at it from that standpoint, we are trading above where we were in the 2010 to 2014 area. And that's with a WTI price that's lower than it was at times um, during the, that five year stretch. So kind of in a better place here today than we were even back then because of the impact of the exchange rates. It's one of the biggest bullish cases to be invested in Canadian equities versus some of the other international peers. Um, especially against the American companies, obviously, because the US dollar has stayed as the US dollar, <laughs> one to one. So point definitely to um, understand. Eco gas, so the Canadian gas uh, has, has dropped a little bit from last month, but still, if you compare it to last year, you know, we're more than double where we were. And again, if you think of it as a profit uh, side of things, Basically, the profit probably has gone up 500% from where we were um, in, in this timeline uh, last year. And the front months have kind of come down because we had to refill storage. There's some maintenance going on on the TCPL pipeline system. But the overall strip is actually looking better and better. We look into 2025, 2026, things are looking quite good. We are seeing slow increases in pricing every month, every week. And it just helps these companies and investors in these companies get kind of more surety of the cash flows going forward. Even though the strip this far out isn't really that accurate, the fact is it's moving up. So if the whole thing moves up, it's obviously a good sign. Um, I'd like to mention Dutch TTF, European gas, Europe, is in a bad spot and European gas is pushing up basically the entire global market. We look at TTF gas here, it was roughly $20. I believe this is euros per megawatt hour uh, about two years ago. About a year ago, we were still at 40, 30 to 40. Today we're at 190. So if you're looking at producers that are exposed to European gas pricing, this thing has just continued higher. You can say it was the, um, the February, March time was kind of the high. Well, obviously not the case. We have continued even higher into this winter. And that's with a lot of work being done to mitigate the demand in Europe, to start burning coal, to start nuclear plants. People are installing diesel generators and the price of gas just keeps going up there's not enough molecules for people that were on these Twitter spaces, these calls six months ago, a year ago, there was alarm bells flashing. Like, look, what are you doing? You're collapsing your coal, uh, product, um, coal power generation 
you know, you're, you're out here nonchalantly just doing things as if they're fine. And then now look what's happened. Things have just gone from zero to hundred in like six months. It's gone completely panic mode. So the reason I mentioned that is because the same thing is happening in oil. People are not paying attention. There's financial issues going on. There's people playing games with the, with the paper markets. There's narratives being thrown around. Nobody's really getting to the source of the issue until it's going to be too late. When is that? Six months, a year? We don't know. But the problem is getting worse, not better. And nobody really cares to fix it. Um, so there's a question here. Is ACO related to Henry Hub? Yeah. So they are related, but ACO will seem to have some sort of disconnect when Henry Hub is above five or six dollars US. Because at that pricing, with the Canadian inventories being so low, we have to stop exporting as much to the US and put some into storage. And there's just a disconnect there. But you will see if Henry Hub comes down, the ACO price actually will be probably pretty stable where it is. So it's almost like a low, you no, know, a high floor, high ceiling kind of investment where it's going to stay where it is, even if Henry Hub goes down and eventually the entire market will re-rate if Henry Hub stays high for a longer period of time. Uh, great question. So winter 2023 TTF pricing keeps going higher. Winter 2024 TTF pricing, AKA Europe, keeps going higher. There is no end in sight in the near to midterm, even going two years out, people are paying, you know, this price used to be 15, now it's 80 in less than two years, in about 18 months. So definitely gonna have a long-term impact on the, on the viability of European manufacturing and processing and, and, and everything else that happens there, one to watch going forward. Uh, for sure, not just from an investment perspective, but from a, just a global uh, ESG, uh, the government regulation perspective of the world. So coming back to inventories. So we have crude, uh, 2021 drew at about a million barrels a day globally. So in a world that consumes about 100 million barrels of product, we drew crude by about, by about 1 million barrels a day. It's kind of continued into 2022, but not really. And we see January 2022, the commercial inventories are the same as May, uh, January to May, kind of the latest confirmed figures we have. And there's only one reason for that, SPR. The SPR, strategic petroleum reserves, don't get counted in the commercial stocks. So what they've done, they've taken this chart that was just continually going down and had gone down to a level where people were getting uncomfortable. Now they've supplanted that with the SPR releases. So the chart looks normalized until you dig a little bit deeper. And I'll talk about the SPR here just in a few slides. So again, we had this billion barrel build when COVID hit. We had OPEC cut production. We saw consistent declines throughout 2020, 2021, and 2022 has been roughly flat so far. That's with Omicron hitting. That's with China shut down for basically all of April, May, parts of June, even today, cut down. And that's just the reality of what's happening. There's been no random build or inventory normalization. This orange line is what Goldman Sachs predicted in January was going to happen. It did not happen. We, we see this January trend here in blue. And this is the latest data that I have for until July. The trend never normalized. We just kept drawing uh, despite, again, Omicron, demand destruction, despite the recession fears, despite China being locked down and all this narrative being thrown, people throwing the kitchen sink, Joe Biden basically being addicted to the price of gasoline. 
seems like that's all he can think of these days. Uh, despite all this, we're still drawing inventories. And this updated orange line, you know, that, that Goldman Sachs has put out is at $125 Brent for the rest of this year and 115 for next year. If that doesn't happen, this line will be even lower because if the prices are lower, the demand will be higher. That's just a basic case for how the commodities work. Um, I, I will talk about the Chinese build here, uh, Mike, just give me a few more minutes. So again, when we look at crude oil and products, so we take, you know, not just oil, but products, we were drawing at 2 million barrels a day globally. So 1 million barrel a day of crude, 1 million barrels a day of products. So there was many vocal folk on Twitter saying, look, we have a diesel problem. We have a gasoline problem. We need refining many, many, many months ago. Nobody paid attention. Now we're in a diesel shortage. We can't find certain grades of oil, middle distillates, uh, et cetera, especially in kind of the US Northeast, some other areas of the world, they're kind of getting fragmented from the global market. And again, nobody paid attention until it was too late when the problem could have been somewhat alleviated early on. And the trends are clear. The data is just clear what's happening here. 2022, bit of a slowdown so far. Again, there's been a lot of impacts to demand so far this year. We are finally getting into kind of a open, open road ahead in a way. Um, there's still COVID issues in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, some Southeast Asian countries. So it's still not home free. The world is still not as open as it could be or it should be um, two and a half years into this, this uh, virus. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, this chart is global uh, coal. And this is Morgan Stanley's work, uh, really, really solid data track in here. Um, focusing on the US itself, down it's just down we have 2021 in yellow here it was down um we have 2022 was drawing at an even bigger pace the pace has kind of normalized a little bit so this is an older chart we're at roughly 1.675 here uh, about week 27 now so has normalized a little bit um, this is the same chart but in a cumulative format so you see the pace of the decline in inventory is something we've never had before to this level. And for this long, nothing really changing. We do see a little bit of a change here at the end. We'll see how things go. It hasn't really stayed that way. We have continued to draw in the last couple of weeks again. So watching closely, but nothing really tells me that this is as sudden of a reversal as this chart makes it seem here because we've seen these before right here once twice maybe three times this is the fourth iteration and nothing nothing really has changed um okay so any thoughts on incremental gas to oil switching so there's going to be a lot of gas to oil switching you better believe it and whether there's a number I can give you right now, not really, no, but there's, there's numbers being thrown around, upwards of two to three million barrels of fuel oil, residual oil, this heavy heavy blends that are gonna be burnt, but we don't know yet. There's, there's no re real reason to speculate. We'll see it happening in real time as things go on. We'll see it in the news cycle and we'll see it from an inventory standpoint of the heavy distillates and residuals and fuel oils as kind of the winter comes, uh, comes along here. Again, US total oil inventory. This is the same graph right here, but in a five-year format. And you can see we're in a completely different regime right now of, of oil inventories. So, um, yeah, so there's a comment here. I doubt they'll do much gas to oil switching. So uh, 
again, there's there's no point speculating right now. It doesn't it doesn't give us any other information. So we'll kind of wait for it to happen. And I know it's going to happen in Asian countries, Pakistan, possibly Japan. If Sakhalin two gets gets shut down, uh, you might. There's already countries in Europe filling up their oil tanks on the dual dual fuel power plants. Countries like Switzerland. Um, I know for sure. I'm not sure of the others. So there is going to be some impact, but we'll see what ends up happening. There's again, there's no point <laughs> talking too much about it. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, the draws are already concerning a boss. So I'll I'll share why here as I kind of go on. And is there any limit to the LNG exports from the U.S. to Europe? Yeah, it's about 12 BCF a day. And I think if the price US domestically started going way too high, there would be a lot of pressure to kind of shut down some of these at the expense of Europe, possibly as things go on here this winter. But it's about 12 to 14 BCF, somewhere in there. I don't track LNG that closely, but it's somewhere in there. So US crude storage, including the SPR, like, concerning, absolutely concerning. This light blue line is a 2010 to 2014 average when oil prices were between 90 and 110 stable. Um, we're not only drawing, we're drawing at a much faster pace than even those times. We're also about, hmm, call it over, over 100 million barrels short already. So now people are gonna say, what does it matter? We still have 900 million barrels big deal you know not a problem well two things one we've never been in this sort of regime before where we're at this low inventories with this high demand so yeah it may not be a problem that we have low inventories you're just gonna have to pay more for them whether that's because the price itself is higher whether that's because people want to put a premium on oil whether that's because people will pay extra upfront to make sure they have oil. You know, let's say your refinery, you're making $35 a barrel in crack spreads. Do you want even a 5% chance that you run out of oil and you can't process it? Now you got to deal with your shutting down your refinery, you don't make the crack spread. Or would you rather pay two, three, five dollars extra upfront and just guarantee you have oil for August, September, October, November? That's a question that's going to be answered here as, um, as things kind of go on. Um, so we'll see. Keep in mind, this is only nine days of global oil consumption. It's, it's not as big as people think it is. And if you're America, people are relying on you. You have been the savior through shale 2014 onwards. You have been the savior for the last three months and for this year with the SPR. People are relying on you. If people see, oh, like their bank account seems to be running very low, how long are they going to be able to sustain this? Well, you can't print oil. You can print money. You can't print oil. So you can't go in the negative. Um, we'll, see, we'll see this immovable mountain meet the unstoppable force kind of in October, November time when the SPR releases kind of run out. So watching, watching closely. Um, US line fill. So when I say we're hundred million barrels short from where we were in 2010 to 14, we're actually even more short. And the reason is from 2014, we added roughly 50 million barrels of line fill. And what does that mean? That means we've built pipelines that are actively in use with about 50 million barrels that are in those pipelines at any given time. Because that oil is in the pipelines, it's unusable. As in, you can't just pull the oil out and claim its inventory because if you pull the oil out, the pipeline becomes unusable and you can no longer pump oil from the Permian to Cushing or from the Permian to the US Gulf Coast. It's, it, it just doesn't make sense. You need the pipeline to be always full of liquid. So take another 50 million barrels of usable inventory out of this picture. We're about 150 to 175 million barrels short 
already. And the SPR uh, plus commercial crude inventory, the trend hasn't really changed. It's, it's still drawing. So that gap just gets wider and wider, you know, because the 2010 to 14 average was not drawing at these sorts of rates. Um, okay, so yeah. So these are all great questions. I just don't wanna derail the, the momentum of the presentation. So I'll try and hit on these, uh, David, and kind of the others as I go on. Uh, if I miss it, I'll kind of hit it at the end there, uh, if you wouldn't mind re-asking. Uh, but I do appreciate everyone joining in today. Uh, always great. So um, maybe it's a good time for anyone that joined late on Twitter. You want to look at the visuals, uh, whitetundra.ca. The website is also on my Twitter profile. If you scroll to the bottom under events, there's a Zoom link and you can check out the visuals uh, as well. So back to the presentation, we have the SPR. Um, the last four years, this is 2022. You know, a boss, you asked, when is it concerning? I mean, the, it doesn't have to get to panic level 100 to be concerning. The trend itself is concerning. This is the same graph on a cumulative level for the last 20 years. We have never drawn the SPR at these sorts of rates ever. We go back to a 40 year chart. Does the slope of this line now look concerning? That's the question that's up to you to answer. For me, this is a big deal. When people see this, they see insurance policy. If we have a, a hurricane, if we have a war, even if we have a shortage for any reason of crude oil, the US refiners know they have a source. The oil that's a, that gets exported to certain areas of the world, they know they have a source of 600, 700 million barrels that was sitting here. Now they see this chart and they say, well, hang on a sec. This, there's like 150 million barrels down already. And how much is the US gonna give us? Are they gonna drain this to what level? Nobody really knows. And when you're driving around in your vehicle without insurance, do not recommend doing that at all. But if you are, you will drive much slower. You will likely drive very carefully, take the back roads, make sure you don't get into any accidents. That's the point that's being trying to made here. So um, the pace, the pace of the drawdown is just extreme. Um, whether it's for political reasons, whether it's for other reasons, I don't want to comment, but it's concerning. Uh, okay, so when we look at US product inventories, so we looked at crude products, not too bad, still below our five year average. We are still roughly at 375 million. So just extend this line straight out to here. And that's where we are, still below the five year average, both in crude and the SPR and products. It's not just oh, we got crude drawing, but products are building somewhere else. No, everything is down, um, which is why you see people, uh, sorry, not people, you see the price of gasoline and, and diesel are a little bit higher compared to the price of WTI than they were in the past because we just have a shortage. We have a lower inventory. A gasoline below the fiber average, we saw builds last few weeks and then a big drawdown uh, recently expected to continue, I think, going forward. There was too much incorrect information being thrown out about the implied demand number, which I think a lot of people don't still don't understand. Um, so gasoline demand is definitely not as weak as the EIA had put out. So I think I expect this inventory to continue drawing down. Diesel distillates again below our five-year average. And if we compare it to some of the more middle areas, we're quite a bit below, like this is 20% below where we were. Some of the refinery calls this week had highlighted this again. We have a diesel shortage. We just cannot 
catch up. No matter what, we're seeing demand destruction in diesel in some areas, they still aren't able to catch up. So definitely want to watch um, as things go. You'll probably see the diesel price continue to be much higher than the gasoline price in the US for quite a while, I would say, until the refineries can catch up in some way. Okay, so we got jet fuel, not too concerning, but still the trend over the last five years is, is down. We're down roughly 10% uh, built recently. Nothing crazy, we're, we're hitting levels that are never ever seen. So definitely watch. Um, jet fuel is more of a lower, lower demand fuel. So not as much inventory, but a, a quick change in demand or supply can affect the inventories pretty massively in a few months. Propane, so we've, the US has doubled their propane production, but they keep exporting more and more because the world wants it. The emerging markets want propane. They want it for their heating fuels. They want it for their cooking gas. They want it for power generation, all kinds of stuff. They are hungry for it. They are thirsty for it. And they will take every extra barrel that's out there. Um, looking at it more from a growth perspective, we saw exports grew just a little bit, not at the pace we were growing before. And we see consumption has, has actually declined domestically and could be various reasons for this. And yet still propane inventories are below their five-year range. So once again, the production is growing. We have exports are not growing as much and consumption is down and we still are low inventories. We still can't catch up. So imagine what happens if the demand starts going up, if the export demand starts going up. These inventories will never be able to catch up to their five-year average. And that's the situation we are in today, but nobody's paying attention because they keep saying, oh, we're in a decent enough range, it's fine. We still have 60 million of propane, don't even worry about it. It's not the absolute level, it's the trend of where things are going that we need to pay attention to. So more on the Canadian side, Canadian crude inventories um, at the lower end of their operational range. Not much uh, I can add there. The picture speaks a thousand words. We've drained it to the lower end of the range and that's basically where we sit. Why is this the lower end of the range? Because the rest is oil that's again in pipelines. It's oil at the bottom of storage tanks. It's oil that's in minimum emergency requirement. So you can't drain it. You, they will not allow you. And in some cases you physically cannot access this oil. And why do I mention this? Because again, if I show this chart without these lines, these black lines to somebody, They'll say, oh, we still have 20 million barrels, big deal. It, it is a big deal because you can't use 17 of it. So we need to start looking at it from this standpoint. How much can we actually use that's there? Same thing with the US number, 900 million barrels sitting there. How much of it can we actually drain if we need it? 300, 400, if that. How much are sitting in refinery tanks that they're not gonna give you no matter what? Another 50, 75, 100 million? So keep these things in mind. It's not the absolute number, it's the trend and it's the actual usable inventory. Um, okay, moving a little bit more globally, Saudi inventories, we've drained 200 million barrels in the last six years slowly building, nothing crazy, because the crude that's building, we've seen declines in Saudi product inventories. So they've kind of been counteracting each other. And the fact of the matter is we're still 200 million barrels below where we were in 2014 in this 2010 to 14 range. So when I talk about insurance, people saw Saudi, they said, oh, 
they've got, you know, about, what is this, 45 days of exports roughly in inventory. Well, now they got 20 days, less than 20 days. And how much of this is unusable? We come back to the same question. This 100 and 140 million barrels might all be in pipelines. It might all be in uh, refinery tanks. It might all be in storage tanks that you cannot use. So how much actual extra inventory do we have? Maybe not that much. Um, and it's kind of obvious because when, when the graph stops declining, that tells you that we're at some sort of operational minimum range that we can't go below. So it's not just Canada, it's not just North America, Saudi Arabia, the world's biggest producer is suffering from the same inventory shortage um, as everyone else. Fujara, one of the biggest ports, it's getting bigger and bigger as a stopover point, um, uh, mostly for diesels and heavy residual oils. Why do I mention this? Because the inventory is not that bad. It, it's not the inventories I wanna talk about here. It's two things. One, Russian fuel oil is showing up in Fujara. We see that in the heavy slash, slash residue category here. So that's one thing. The second thing, Europe can take a lot of oil from here for their power gen needs this winter. So if we track Fujara inventories, it's gonna tell us two things as time goes on. One, how much extra Russian fuel oil is being sent to this area and Singapore, you know, this, this general area, how much extra fuel oil is on the market? So Russia and Saudi, I should say. Secondly, it's gonna tell us how much gas to oil switching are we seeing in Europe? Because if we have extra fuel oil sitting around, it might sell for cheaper, Europe might decide that they do wanna use this instead of burning natural gas. And right here is a real live week by week indicator. It's not the end all be all, but it's an indicator as to what's happening between those two markets. And this is updated weekly, it's available and definitely gonna be tracking this. It's gonna give me an early insight into how the winter is going along. Um, and how things are going along here. Um, okay, so maybe I should uh, talk about this here. So there's a question here, what's going to happen if the Russia and Ukraine war ends? This has been something I've been asked for the last four months, basically nonstop. And A, what are the chances of this happening? Okay, we need to be realistic about what are the chances of these left tail cases, these right tail cases happening. Is there any indication that the Russia-Ukraine war is gonna end? I don't really see anything. But if you do wanna go down the speculative path, okay, so they end, the war ends, then what? Does Exxon and Shell and uh, whoever else go rushing into Russia back and start investing billions of dollars? Probably not. They just got their stuff annexed. Like they had to sell, sell their fields at probably you know, 50 cents on the dollar or less. They had to leave a bunch of equipment sitting there. They put their people in danger. <clears throat> They're not gonna go rushing in. It's, it's just not gonna happen. No matter what you say, yeah, there's oil flowing here and there some way or the other, that's fine. But people are not gonna make investments and Russia needs investments to keep their production declines from occurring and from new greenfield projects to add to the production uh, going forward. And that, in my opinion, is not going to happen. So I think we'll leave that be. And, you know, it's very interesting if, if somebody wants to read up on this, Russia, when the USSR split, and I'm kind of digressing here, but it's very important to this exact question that, <clears throat> When the USSR split, there was roughly 260 or something production sharing agreements in place in Russia. So 
companies that were non-Russian could come in and share production, as in share in the oil production, if they contributed to the capital cost and the operating, et cetera. There's only two left. Out of those 260 some, Putin has taken back like 99.5% of them. There's only two left, Sakhalin one and Sakhalin two. Guess which two he's going after right now. He's already kicked the partners out of Sakhalin one, Exxon and a couple others. Read the news today, this week, this month. He's trying to cancel the PSA production sharing agreement on Sakhalin two which is the LNG project with Shell and two Japanese companies. So the goal all along has been to take back control of their oil industry by canceling these production sharing agreements. If the war ends today, do you think he's gonna say, oh yeah, come back in and we'll give you a share of the production? There you go, that's the answer to that question. And one that I think we need to go deeper into the understanding of Russia, Ukraine, oil production in Russia to answer this question. It's not just if the war ends, we go back to normal. There's very, very deep rooted issues here that are being targeted by the Russian administration. And I'm not gonna sit here and, and, and claim to be an expert on Russian history. It's just something I came up with while I did my research trying to answer this exact question. Um, so I do appreciate the, the question. Okay, back to the inventories. We have Singapore inventories. Again, I talked about Fujara. We also talked about Singapore. Look what started to accumulate in the last three months. Heavy sulfur fuel oil. Again, this is gonna tell you the same thing. How much extra fuel oil is Russia exporting? How much gas to oil switching is happening in Europe? If this starts to build and build and build, that tells me Europe is not switching and Russia is keep exporting extra fuel oil. If this starts to draw or go down to zero, Europe has done a lot of gas to oil switching or Russian exports are lower. It's that simple. We don't need to speculate. We get this data every week. In fact, every day, if you really want it. Um, China. There's talk about China building inventory. They took all the oil from the US SPR. Um, so China did build inventories when COVID first hit and they kind of drained it down. This is a very, very old chart, uh, probably seven or nine months old, but the inventories were drawing. Some of the inventories were below pre COVID levels. And this chart is basically the end all be all. So Reuters just put out a piece two weeks ago that said, oh my God, Chinese inventories are building like crazy in, in May. And there's a huge problem here. People took that piece and they just ran with it. It's May, half of China was shut down in May, big deal. We're at the end of July. For the last seven weeks in a row, this only shows six, but for the last seven weeks in a row, we've had Chinese inventory drawing and their economy isn't even fully open yet. How much did they draw? Roughly 40 million barrels over the seven weeks, uh, maybe a little bit less, 30, somewhere between 30 to 40 million barrels already has started to, started to draw. Their economy is just coming in as they head to the election year. It's, it's just getting ramped up with more stimulus. We see prices of iron ore and steel and copper and some other stuff rebound. So again, it's not the absolute number how many barrels did China pick up from, from the US? It's the trend. And you see how drastically the trend has changed in a very, very short period of time. Early shipping data is showing that August, China is going to be back in the market big time, picking up VLCCs and loads for crude imports um, in the month of August and potentially going forward. Has the market baked in a extra 1.5 to 2 million barrel crude import in China starting in two days? I don't think so. But these sorts of things give you early trend indicators as to what's happening 
uh, behind the scenes. The trend has definitely changed. China is drawing crude now, and they will continue to draw. Um, likely, as the economy opens, they will either have to draw inventories or they will have to import more, both of which take away from the global market. So moving more into products. So I talked about the diesel shortage. It's right here, middle distillates is where the big problem is, along with jet fuels. You know, these are fine, still at the lower end of the five-year chart, but not too bad, whereas middle distillates are, are really hurting. So something to watch for here, some sort of substitution you might see here. People start burning heavier oil in ships in certain parts of the world instead of middle distillates. We'll see. Uh, floating inventories, this is again an older chart, but I want to talk about China. China built up a bunch of floating inventories when COVID hit and they're all drawn. There, there is no extra ships floating around. There was roughly 40 million barrels that got drained in late 2021 and it's gone. So the point I'm trying to make, th there's not extra oil sitting some random place in a cavern that's you know missing or somebody stashed it there. It's just not the case. We, we see inventory drawing slash flat everywhere. Every extra place we had is drawing and the USSPR is now the latest bullet that's been fired. How long can you, can you keep this going for? At some point, when you're drawing inventories, you have to assume the supply demand get into balance or we get into an oversupply situation we're not seeing it. All you're doing is keep drawing inventories and the supply demand still has that 1.5 to 2 million barrels a day of undersupply. You're not fixing the core issue and you're draining inventories day after day after day. There's gonna come a point, you either have shortages or people pay way more for it. That's the only two ways that this issue is gonna get resolved. The price that we saw the early signs of demand destruction was at $180 to $190 product price. If the crack spread are gonna come down to $30, that tells you crude price is going to 140 to 150 range. Assuming you need demand destruction to get the market back in balance. Um, so just the way things are looking. And we have some indications how to back it up. Um, just to add to that a point is when you're, when you're looking at the macro outlook on oil as an investor, just to say that, oh, the chances of oil going $30 up and going $30 down is the same, is just lazy analysis. The data is out there for you to have a better expected value range as to what's gonna happen here or what's projected to happen. The price of oil going up $30 and the amount of undersupply slash supply demand dynamic required is completely different than for it to go down $30. It's not a linear curve. And I think that's a point that is going to become very important going forward. Um, and I'll talk about it later in the end as to why uh, I think so. So oil on the water, um, nothing, nothing really has built here. So what's oil on the water? It's the oil that's being carried by ships currently in progress, like, like they're in transit. And there was some talk that because Russia was sending oil to India and China instead of Europe, there was going to be more oil on the water at a given time. Not the case, we, we haven't seen it. In fact, inventories have gone down since February, March, April time. Uh, Iran is having to use up their floating storage because their own people won't stop consuming gasoline and diesel and natural gas. So they can't even sell it. They now have to start bringing it back on shore to consume it. Um, keep an eye out for this phenomenon. Uh, I'll share more on my Twitter feed as, as things go on, but. This is very interesting in the Middle East. When you have countries that heavily subsidize 
petroleum consumption and they are getting record revenues from oil exports, their internal consumption can go up at rates that are absolutely mind boggling. So keep an eye on, on, these, um, on these sorts of things happening. Um, so Dave, uh, great comment. Yeah, so the point I'm trying to make here is the, the price of oil and the expected value on it is not a normally distributed curve. It's a normally distributed curve with an excessive positive skew on it. So the, there is the downside case, yes, but if you just Google a normally distributed curve with a positive skewness, you'll see what I'm talking about as to the expected probability um, that I'm seeing here. Um, yeah, you're right, energy blocker. The, the, the floating, it's not crude. This is a wrong, the, the whole reporting is wrong. It's, it's gas condensates. Um, but the point being, it's being refined maybe within Iran to be converted to gasoline or whatever's happening, it's being brought back instead of this excess slug sitting there uh, ready to be sold, but great point. I do appreciate that. Uh, so where does it go? Thanks to PDV on Twitter for these charts. So the purple is the actual inventory in the US. The other lines here are what the EIA projected for inventories. And there's two words to describe this. Embarrassingly wrong, completely wrong. They figure there's this random change that's gonna happen where we go from drawing inventories to immediately building inventories for no rhyme or reason. And they've been wrong so far, completely wrong. It's, it's not even close uh, what's, what's happened here. And the same thing in April, again, not correct. Now, if we look at July, they have been partially correct because inventories have gone to this 1200 million or 1.2 billion a barrel range. So they have rebounded. Why? Because of the SPR. <laughs> the, the SPR got jacked up crazily in, in this April, May timeframe so that this just tracks commercial inventories. So yeah, if you drain 90 million barrels from your SPR in three months, of course the commercial inventories are gonna build up a little bit, but they're still wrong because they expected it to go by July to about you know, 1250, it's only gone to 1200. So it's still wrong. Uh, don't believe any of this stuff. When you look at news releases coming out that the STEO said this, the EIA DPR report said that. Like if you're gonna be this wrong consistently and you don't fix your model, why should I trust you at all? This tells me not only do you realize you're wrong, you don't even fix it month after month after month, put out the same, the exact same stuff. Um, so not, not that great. Um, another one here, they're giving random increases to to world oil supply. Um, I don't wanna to go too deep into this. I've kind of made my point here. Uh, more on the demand side, US demand, yeah, it's lower than the five-year average. Look at the first three months of the year. There's something wrong in the data here that the EIA is putting out. If you normalize this 27 weeks, we're basically straight, exactly where we should be. Um, so where are we here? Yeah, okay. Um, the model retail gasoline demand, I've talked about this before, uh, gas buddy guy, Josh Young has talked about this. They just took a wrong number and people ran with it. Focus on the actual data. It's still looking strong. It's up 1% every week. That's 100,000 barrels every week. Uh, US vehicle miles driven, highest in June, July. We see the 2022 number is back to 2019 levels. And that's with the retail price of gasoline being 60% higher. 
So when we say demand elasticity, in elasticity, right here, here is your proof. We really don't need much else. The um, price is 60% higher. The vehicle miles traveled are the exact same. Um, I'll get through this quickly because I want to talk about shale way more. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I've discussed in the past. Um, US gasoline demand, diesel demand are basically still at pre-COVID levels. Jet fuel is about 80%, still lagging. And we already have a desolate shortage, slash jet fuel shortage. What if this normalizes back to 100%? Where is the diesel going to come from? Where is the jet fuel going to come from? Um, the trend is your friend. Watch what's happening. Um, no, no demand destruction, really. We see slight demand destruction, but from a level that was 105% of pre-COVID levels. And now we're at 102% of pre-COVID levels. If you're gonna use this and tell me that the oil price is collapsing or is going to collapse, I think there's some better, better work need to be done on your analysis because this demand destruction is not going to be the reason for prices crashing to 70 and the consumer is hurting and the, tr the trucking industry is dead and all these things that people like to throw out without the data to back it up. Um, so global gasoline demand looking good. Asia dropped a little bit. Uh, we, we're seeing pickups in South America, North America, Russia, Europe. Uh, again, counter to what people are saying, European gasoline demand is going higher. From April, it's gone higher, not lower. Completely different to the narrative of what the so-called experts like to talk about. Um, for me, people ask, why didn't you sell in May? Why didn't you sell in June? Why didn't you sell your equities in July? Show me on this graph the reason why I should sell. There's nothing on the fundamental side of things that shows any sort of issue uh, with global oil demand. Global daily road traffic index. Show me the demand destruction here. Where, where is it? Hiding in the bushes. It's not there. Uh, diesel demand by continent. This is an older chart about two months ago. Still nothing crazy. Uh, I'll get through this fast. So basically, um, and yeah, great point here. And I'll talk about this here. The, the flights, global flights, slowly rebounding. We aren't where we should be. Why? Staffing shortage, pilot shortage, airports not being ready for this. Like if you're an airport, you had one job. You, you had to predict what the global flight demand was going to be this summer. You only had to look at one data source. You only had to look at one thing. You had all the data in the world on how many tickets were being sold and you still bungled it up. Like there is no excuse for what's happened here. And Emirates fought back against London Heathrow Airport and basically shifted the entire blame to them. Rightfully so. Um, this was a cr crisis slash issue that could have been avoided. And the airports weren't ready for it. Some of the airlines weren't prepared for it. And they were out there daydreaming. Meanwhile, the real world had come back. Um, OK, this jet fuel consumption, again, we haven't got to these levels that we were predicting in April because staffing shortage, pilot shortage, airline issues. So that, that means there's still about a million barrels a day of jet fuel demand yet to come. Where is it gonna come from? Exactly, where, where is it gonna come from? We, we don't have the inventories, supply hasn't caught up, demand is through the roof, simple. Uh, where are we struggling? International seats. So domestic seats are going above 2019 levels. So again, this point that I want to make here, if you're telling me demand destruction is happening, from what level? You cannot compare it to pre-COVID levels. Oil demand goes up one to 1.5 million barrels every year. 2019 was 100 million barrels a day. 2022 
is somewhere between 103 and 104.5. If you're saying there's a 2% demand destruction from that, we're still above pre-COVID levels. And here's the data that shows it. Domestic seeds this year are going to be above 2019 levels and probably continue higher as the issues, the staffing issues sort themselves out. International flights not rebounding as fast, but they're closing the gap to 2019 and maybe go higher next year. Million barrels a day still to come, maybe over a million barrels a day. So that's demand you can't even disrupt because it hasn't constructed yet back to where it should be. Um, Chinese flight demand tells you exactly what's going on. If you're trying to understand how COVID policies are affecting the country, you don't need to look at COVID numbers, hospitalizations, none of that. Look at flight demand. Number of flights running will tell you exactly how their COVID policies are affecting the economy. Run this through 2021, run this through, through, through 2022. I bet you this goes exactly with overall petroleum consumption and overall economy's uh, health, this exact chart. Where is the issue? International flights. China to non-China flights have been very, very low. Uh, the domestic consumption has picked up, but the long haul high jet fuel usage flights have not picked up. International traffic, less than a 10th of pre-pandemic levels. India flight demand, concerning. There's been a drop off recently. What's happening? It's domestic flights. Search up India domestic flights. It's staffing shortages. It's plane maintenance issues. It's pilot shortages. It's, it's issues that are completely unrelated to, to demand destruction. It's problems that are going to be fixed. Um, so run through these here. Australia, looking pretty good. Canada, basically at pre-COVID level. Japan, slowly rebounding. Japan is very interesting because Japan is really suffering from a very, very bad COVID wave right now. And you can see they don't have a zero COVID policy. They said, we don't care. We're going to live with this. We're going to keep our economy open. And they're walking the walk. That's why I love these charts. They tell you exactly how the country is dealing with COVID. And some of these countries are so opaque, you can't really get the data as to what's happening, what's mobility looking like. Here you go. This, this is basically telling you uh, bang on. Um, Malaysia done a really poor job. These countries have done a poor job with getting their travel back online. Um, Indonesia as well, uh, you know, haven't, haven't done a good job. This was their summer to get their travel economy back booming. They haven't come up to the task. Jet fuel demand that's been deferred. It's going to come. These economies are built on travel and businesses and uh, conferences. It's going to come back. Uh, South Africa, I like mentioning South Africa because show me where the Omicron happened, where all the countries were canceling flights to South Africa and all this. You can't even point it out on this chart. So it gave you a good indication that Omicron was not as bad as the uh, doomsdayers were making it out to be. Um, and why I doubled down in November and December and took a whole bunch of money out on margin went fully balls to the wall, if you will, um, because I just didn't see the impact in the country where it supposedly came from. Um, yeah, so, so Banka and Adam, um, these, so these questions, I don't wanna get to today, but I did, I did answer this inflation adjusted question in my previous macro session near the end. Uh, so please have a look at that. I don't wanna have this go on for uh, five hours like that one. So I took out some slides, um, but I did put that in, yes. And Adam, uh, Ed Morse at City, he had one good call in, I think it was 2013 or 2014 or 08. I don't even know when. Since then, his data is not supporting the forecast he's putting out. He's saying Russia is gonna grow by a million barrels a day. He's saying US is gonna grow by a million barrels a day. Where is it? We don't see it in the uh, supply demand. Uh, yes, Mark, I know, I know you want this to go on for five hours, but uh, um, yeah, I think, I think we'll keep it a little, just a little bit shorter than that. 
Um, okay, so we have uh, Spain, Europe, we have, uh, what is this? Uh, so we have Vietnam. Vietnam is one country that's done really, really well coming out of COVID. They've restarted their manufacturing, their textiles, really strong tourism industry. You know, they, they've done a good job. Why can't Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore do the same thing? Because they've shot themselves in the foot with regulations. The Chinese tourists have not come back yet. So that's another big factor. When you look at Chinese flight demand, it's not just people traveling to China, it's Chinese tourists going to Malaysia, Singapore, Europe, North America, South America. That All that demand is still to come. And we're 2 million barrels a day undersupplied. And the price of oil is still at $100 a barrel with the SPR being released. There's your bullish case in one sentence. Uh, Spain, people talk about Eurozone collapsing. They, people can't survive, people are dying. It doesn't look like it. These, the Spanish flights are still looking good. We look at um, UK, we look at Germany, you know, not at pre-COVID levels yet because again of London Heathrow issues, Germany airport issues, nothing, nothing that's like showing a sudden collapse in, in anything. So you can talk about PMIs and year over year, this and that, all you want. The oil demand has not been affected. Um, some countries are making use of this. Mexico, Dominican Republic, the flights are well above pre-COVID levels and staying there. Again, you cannot just compare everything to pre-COVID because there's exact data showing oil demand is going to be above pre-COVID levels by some margin. Um, what is this here, Colombia on top, this is Greece. You know, again, tourist focused countries that have done well. Greece, 21% of their GDP is tourism. So if you're telling me they're gonna be in a recession and all this, have you taken tourism into account? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so, um, so Philip asks, uh, no. So, so the 2 million barrels a day is undersupplied with the SPR taken into account. So it's 2 million barrels a day undersupplied with the SPR US release, it's 1 million barrel a day undersupplied. And with the global SPR release, it's maybe 800 to 900,000 undersupplied. Keep in mind, the SPR is not a uh, free oil cavern that continues on forever. There's, there's limits to it. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, I do have gasoline to burn you, right? Um, and just before I get to shale, a small point on natural gas. People are asking me, what's going on? How come natural gas keeps spiking with Freeport down? Right here, natural gas spikes when there's a perceived shortage going into the winter. See how we were already below the five-year average? And the trend again is your friend. You see how the gap is widening. People are watching this in real time and saying, oh, are we going to have enough storage come wintertime, come September, October, November? Should we just pay extra right now and confirm we have supplies? If you were living in Montana, if you were living in uh, Oregon, if you're living in Chicago, what would you do? Would you rather pay a dollar for MCF extra and make sure you're warm for the winter? Or would you try and mess around and try and save a buck and ends up you don't have battery running low. Suck here. Uh, oh, this is not good. Stay laggy on me. Okay, I hope this is still good. So, is the audio still good on Zoom? I just had to reconnect the charger and some got screwed up here. Okay, right on. Um, okay, sweet. 
okay, so which country natural gas levels? This is US, this is American natural gas uh, storage. So um, yeah, so Dave asked a good question. I think it's, it's, it's a good time to talk about it right now, actually. The, the heavy pricing is definitely being impacted by the SPR release. So you're seeing an excess of crude available to refiners, especially the sour grades. The, as mid-August to late August, they actually switch into the sweet grades uh, going forward. That should help the price. And then going into November, December, uh, as the SPR ends, you'll see that differential climb back up. Another thing that's causing an issue is there's an excess of, of fuel oil on the markets. So this heavy sulfur stuff, it is just getting a little bit less money for it. Uh, but as we go into the winter, the gas to oil switching happens, you might see that market get, get a little bit better. Um, so any chance the SPR releases extended to end of 2022? Sure. Keep on keeping on, like keep on draining it, you know, because it's great. The more you drain it, the less the insurance there is, the higher the price is going to be. The yeah, the SPR, you can keep releasing it, but the price action on the contract will reflect that lack of available supplies are going forward. So um, the market could be in the exact same position it is today. 2 million barrels a day undersupplied, 1 million barrel a day SPR release, but the price could be 30, 40, 50 dollars higher to reflect that lack of crude availability. Um, again, it all depends on the supply demand dynamic and where it's going to be when the SPR release ends. And that's why I want to talk about US shale, because the world is still relying on US shale. People are putting out predictions that they're going to grow this, they're going to grow that. Fine, we will debunk that entire theory right here. Um, and so the, the top here is US production. So we got the black line. We see 12.1 um, last week, 11.9 here, which is basically the exact same as we were seven months ago. So no real growth over the last seven months. And year over year, you know, 11, three ish. So about 600,000 barrels a day, year over year growth. In the meantime, the rig count has gone from 350, 375, 400 to about 600. This is the oil rig count. So rigs are ramping up and we've grown 600,000 barrels a day. So based on this, you might think things are fine. We had low rigs, so we had low growth. Now we have more rigs, so we're gonna have more growth. Um, basic level analysis and uh, sounds, uh, sounds like it makes sense, but the rig count has started to flatline. That's the first issue. This is the last month and various rig count basically flat. We look at this on a one year perspective. The trend, again, look at the trend. It's going up, 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 up. There's been a slowdown in the slope of this line and now it's completely flat. Over the last, call it five weeks, it's completely flat. So that's your first indication that there's the supply chain problem is now completely tapped out. You're now at the maximum level of rigs that could be easily brought on in a three to six month kind of time frame um, as the oil prices were going up, it's no longer rising. So if you're expecting this, this rig count to continue going up, I guess we'll see. We, we're not seeing it yet. Over the last five weeks, there's a definite slowdown here. Also, the growth, the 600,000 barrel a day, year over year growth, um, is because of DUCs. So drilled uncompleted wells. What is this? This is our second insurance policy that we've taken out on US shale. What they did, they have a bunch of wells that they drilled. So A, the drilling rig has already drilled them. B, they already have casing in the ground. You don't have to worry about steel shortages or labor shortages because it's already been drilled. You already have casing in the ground. You've already cleared out the surface pad. You most likely have some equipment on site already. So it's our second insurance policy. And guess what? This insurance policy has expired. So for a long time, we drained 
these extra drilled uncompleted wells. Why? They were cheaper. You did have to drill the well. All you had to do was frack it and you could bring it on production. You didn't have to worry about rig availability or drill pipe or steel or casing or drilling fluids or parts. You just completed the well. And this has gone on for about 18 months now. And so we went from where we here, like 8,500 DUCs to about 4,000 DUCs. Um, okay, so why am I saying it's done? Here's a monthly change, the same chart, thanks to, I believe this is Rory Johnston that puts out these awesome work. Um, so again, the same chart on a more of a cumulative by oil focused. So overall, we went from 8,500 to 4,000. If we look at just the oil plays, we went from about 7,500 to 3,500. So drawing down mostly the Permian. Um, what's the problem here? So out of these 3,500, more than 2,000 are dead DUCs. Dead DUCs are ones that were drilled pre-2019. And if they haven't been completed so far, we assume they're dead, meaning they didn't hit oil, they had a collapse of the geologic formation, it was not economic oil, they screwed up the drilling and went outside the zone, they hit water, et cetera, et cetera. The EIA still classifies these as drilled uncompleted wells because that's what they are. But they're not oil wells, they're just wells. So take 2,000 out. So there's 3,500, 3,200. We take another 2,000 out. We only have about 1,200 left. Um, this is another way of looking at it. So we have our dead DUCs are now up to 2,500, okay, over the last year. And there's still about 1,500, 1,000 to 1,500 DUCs left. So, so what are they? Why can't we complete them? because they're operational inventory. And operational inventory means if you have a rig that goes on a site, they drill five wells. In most cases, you can't complete the wells as you're drilling on the same site because of underground uh, communication issues. So this operational inventory are the wells that the existing drilling rig fleet needs or is currently working on. Therefore, you can't complete them. They're not an insurance. They're basically a work in progress. Meaning your abnormal live DUCs are basically zero. You know, there's three or 400 of them it shows here. And these are basically the fringe of the fringe that need 120, $150 oil to even make sense. So they're done. And despite this, massive drawdown in DUCs, shale was only able to grow 600,000 year over year. And now we're seeing it kind of flatline over the last, call it six to eight months. There's already a problem here and we haven't even got into the meat of the discussion here. So MBD per oil rig. Every new oil rig that's getting added is a worse rig whether it's steel, whether it's the quality of the rig, the maintenance, or the, the expertise of the labor on the rig, every new rig is adding less and less oil per rig. So when you go from 400 to 600 rigs, those are decent rigs. When, when we now will go over X amount of time from six to 800 rigs, those rigs are way worse. We see it's a, pretty significant uh, drop off that we've seen already. And it continues on as you need to train more crews, as you need to, you have incidents on site, you need to get people training, there's mistakes being made, there's issues with the rig quality, you have downtime, you're waiting on supply chain issues, whatever you wanna call it, each rig adds less and less and less. The, this is not something that a lot of people are modeling. They're saying 800 rigs today will be the same as 800 rigs X amount of years ago. We don't have the labor that we had to run at those sorts of efficiencies. You know, 
those times we had trained expert crews who could hop in and do the job quickly. No longer the case. We have a lot of green hands. We have a lot of new people. People who may have never done a labor job in their life are now coming onto these rigs and you're having to train them. So keep this in mind. This is the second issue that's occurring. So forecasting, what's the forecast saying? What is the world expecting? OPEC recently took Rystat as one of their data source providers. Um, it's one that is well used across the industry. What are they saying? They're saying we're gonna see 8 million barrels a day of shale growth in the next eight years. So about a million barrels a day is what they're saying per year for the next eight years. Most of it in the Permian, some in the Bakken, Eagleford, mostly in the Permian. Okay, so a million barrels a day for the next eight years, it's gonna meet the world's growing need as India expands, China expands, Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, as these countries expand their oil demand, um, the US is here, why, why are you concerned? What's, what's all this talk about $150 oil and panic and what's the issue here? Well, these are completely bogus. And I'll show you why we're not even gonna get anywhere close to anything like this. Um, before I start, the 600,000 growth that we saw over the last eight months, about 300,000 of that was conventional non-shale oil. This is the old vertical wells from the 1900s and the 1950s getting fixed up because now the workovers make sense at $100 oil. There's these family-run companies that have five wells on a farm. They go in and they increase production from 10 barrels a day to 50 barrels a day, and it just gets aggregated over a massive area. So 300 of the 600 is conventional. That means shale only added 300,000 barrels, even less. Why? Because of the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico, there's some production that Shell brought online. Uh, I believe, well, what's the name of the other company? Uh, there's another company that's brought on some production in the Gulf of Mexico online to the tune of roughly 100,000 barrels a day. So now shale in 18 months or in, in 12 months, as rigs were growing with a record drawdown on DUCs, only added 200,000 barrels of production in a whole year. Did that not set off big warning signs already before we even go into what else is happening? Um, why am I so bullish on this cycle? Why am I so passionate about what's happening here? Um, because the data just doesn't agree with what shale has done for the last five to seven years. So a little bit more on DUCs. We look at the big companies, XTO, Exxon, Chevron, Pioneer, Diamondback. Their DUCs are basically zero. Okay, so the big the big boys, the ones who can actually increase production, they have the money, they have the suppliers, they can brute force their way into getting labor and parts are done. Frack fleets, we're at roughly 290 today. This is March, we're at 290. So back where we were in February, we ran roughly 375 to 400 frack fleets in December of 2019, Jan 2020, before COVID hit. We're 100 frack fleets below that. And not really rising. Again, look at this trend. The, the trend was adding 14 frack fleets a month. And we basically, due to attrition, due to lack of labor, due to all these issues, we don't have the frack fleets to get the production online. And if you're telling me there's a lag in the data, we're at we're approaching six months of $100 oil. We're approaching roughly nine months of $85, $90 oil, at least 80 plus oil. You would think these frack fleets should have been fired up 
if you're going to tell me shale break even is 45, it's, it's 36, it's all this, you should be making tons of money at $80 oil. Why aren't you drill baby drilling here? What's, what's gone wrong? So this tells you what the industry is either doing or is forced to be doing. And it doesn't matter which, which it is, what the constraint is. The point is there's a constraint here that's a huge constraint and it's not getting fixed. It's, you know, you say, oh, they're gonna add them in, in a month, in two months, in three months. That's exactly what they told me in March. It's now August. We still don't see, actually it's at 295. 295 is a little bit higher, but nothing crazy. Um, still not on the trend we were and still about a hundred fleets below pre-COVID. Okay, um, this is kind of an older graph, so I'll leave this. Here's frack fleets from Rystad. Uh, thanks to Maximum Driller for a lot of this data. A really, really good follow. If you're data oriented, uh, the Twitter handle is Devout Driller. Really good data out there. Uh, helps a lot, so thank you. Um, but where is the frack fleet growth? It's been almost a year now, and we're sitting at this 275 to 300 range. Nothing is really happening here in terms of frack, frack spread growth. So the companies are capital discipline themselves, or they're being forced to because of lack of availability uh, slash pricing uh, on these fleets. Here's a little bit more on the pricing. So pricing fell in COVID times, obviously it's now back up to the highs of 2017, 2018, continuing higher as the availability gets less, people are bidding these up. So, um, you know, if you're a private producer that's got five or six wells you wanna drill and complete, you might be priced out or you might just not have availability either way. So many, many problems already. Uh, Permian operations by week, not a huge growth in a year. They've grown roughly, I believe this ended up being a thousand fracks, a thousand fracks over the course of a year. Um, not, not anything that's going to substantially change what's going on here. So the reason I talk about frack fleet so much, because if you have drilling rigs growing, but your frack fleet count isn't growing, that tells you there's a problem here where all the drilling rig growth did was make up for the drawdown in DUCs, that's it. You're not gonna see an increase in fracks because of the rig growth. All you did was make up for the wells that were DUCs are now actually gonna be recent wells that you drilled. You're not gonna see this massive expansion in frack fleets until the rig count goes much, much higher. And this is a point that I think is being missed by a lot of people. They think, oh, the rig count has gone up 40%, therefore we should have 40% more frack fleets. No, you're gonna see the same number of frack fleets. All you've done is instead of completing DUC wells, you're completing recently drilled wells. That's it. That's the only change that's happened here. Big, this is big for the future because growth comes from frack fleets not from drilling rigs. And if the frack fleets haven't really gained that much, what can we expect for production going forward? Can we expect that same 200,000 barrels a day, year over year growth in shale in the next 12 months? I'll, I'll make a case for it as, as good as I can here, potentially even worse than that. So USA supply, bad data. The data of the EIA, I talked about it before, it's getting worse. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Like the difference between the EIA data and the Texas Commission and the New Mexico Commission is getting more and more out of whack. They're not agreeing with themselves. And you can put your tinfoil hat on here and say it's uh, for whatever reason, but the EIA number is not correct. The weekly number that they're putting out that I initially talked about on that rig count chart, it's not correct, it's wrong. So 
when we said there was 200,000 barrels a day of shale growth after conventional, after offshore, year over year, based on EIA data, but the data itself is wrong by 200,000 barrels a day, where does that put you on year over year growth in shale? Zero. That puts you at zero. And I'll show you why. So May 2022, EIA puts out a 914 report every month. It's a couple months delayed. But basically what it tells you is this is the confirmed production for the month. The weekly data is just an estimate. So let's look at April 2022. The weekly numbers were roughly 11,850. We had got two weeks at 11,8 that they reported. We had three weeks at 11,9 that they reported. Roughly 11,850. What did the April number come out at? 11,650. There's your 200,000 barrel a day gap that shale supposedly grew if we only looked at weekly data. Now we look at the real data. That growth could have been in the last year a big fat zero. Let's look at May. May, they had one week at 11.8. They had three weeks at 11.9. That puts you at 11.875. The May number came out at 11.595. It's now 280,000 barrels off what they were reporting for May. So it's just looking worse and worse and worse for the actual field production data. If we, if we try and reconcile all these things, we don't just take things from what the news is telling us, from what the weekly reports are telling us. We go back and we verify everything. Shale is basically, over the last year, has been in a zero growth climate. Um, and I'll show you more data to exactly back that statement up. Um, the DPR report. Every month, there's a drilling productivity report that gets put out, and it's completely fake, bogus data. Absolutely nonsense. Somebody went on Excel and they added a 1.25%, I believe it is, and thanks to Tom, uh, Tom with Flow Partners for this information. They just added a 1.25% growth rate, and they said, screw this, we're just gonna leave it here, and it is what it is. Well, okay. The bottom here shows a DPR report for, uh, I believe this is the February report, what they put out. They said February was 85.98. March is going to be 87.07. Great. Reuters came out with a report. Yahoo Finance came out with a report. Permian production is the highest it's ever been. Production is through the roof, blah, blah, blah. Then they came out with the March report. And they, they brought March production down to even below February levels. They had to adjust it that far down, but they still said April is gonna be the biggest ever, okay? Let's look at April. When the April report came out, they took down April production by about 190,000 barrels in just one month. That's how far this data is absolute garbage. It's, it's, you, you just can't rely on it for anything. Their May estimated number, they still obviously are putting in the 1.25% growth because they don't care about fixing their model. They rather just leave it. Um, the May number was about 60,000 barrels below what they had projected to be a month earlier in April. Okay. And guess what? Next month, there's going to be a news report that Permian production is through the roof according to EIA DPR number. People are going to say, oh, look at this. We have supply coming online. Things are fine. Things are not fine. It's, it's all adjusted data that keeps getting revised downwards month after month after month. Um, OK. Um, there's a long question here. I, I'll read it here in a bit. Um, US supply as well. A lot of supplies coming from the, from the private companies. I'm gonna to refer to this later, so please remember this. The major companies have not really grown their rigs. It's mostly the private companies that are growing it. Uh, the rig count, putting lipstick on a pig, looking to sell these companies. Now that times are kind of good, 
Uh, they're making a bit of money finally. Uh, new upstream private equity commitments, 2016, 2017. There was a new private equity company upstream focused in oil every three days. 2019, it was one every 12 days. 2020, less than one a month. These private equities that are raising rigs are not recent companies. These are companies with stuck money for five, seven, 10 years. They just want to drill, get the production jacked up, make it look good and sell. So far, haven't been successful. Nobody has been baited to buying junk, high decline uh, uh, Permian shale assets. So this stuff just sits there basically in limbo um, with, with nothing really uh, happening here. So here's shale. If they would have produced shale properly, they would have had this sort of curve, the Hubbard linearization curve, the normal growth and the normal down. What they have done is funded it with trillion dollar of cheap debt of which they lost $300 billion. And this is what they've done. They've had this hyper growth cycle. And once they hit the peak, it's not going to be a normalized, normalized curve decline. It's going to fall right off a damn cliff. Like the growth rate slows down, it peaks, and COVID kind of affected this a little bit, but it, the growth slows down, it peaks for a, a, a little bit, and then it just collapses. The US, I shouldn't say US, the, any reservoir which you overcapitalize and overproduce is going to behave the same way. So what's coming? Is 8 million barrels a day of growth coming? Do we have zero growth coming? Is it somewhere in the middle? Or, or are we staring at this massive drop off off a cliff in three, five years, three to five years. There's a huge range here. And that range can be the difference between a lower oil price or a price that we have never seen or even expected um, if this decline was to happen sooner than later. So other problems, gas offtake. These are shale wells, they produce gas. They produce a lot of gas. The gas oil ratios are rising. And we right now have pipeline capacity to get rid of this gas. Why? Because throughout 2019, people over piped the Permian. They built pipes as if the Permian was gonna grow to these massive levels. And with that, they built gas pipelines, natural gas uh, export or takeaway pipelines. So we still have some extra room because of excess sitting there, but going into late 2023, mid 2023, we will not have the capacity. And what are they gonna do with the gas? Well, all they can do is flare the gas. If they wanna keep their wells running, they either have to flare the gas or wait until there's pipelines being built. And there are some being built late 2023, in 2024, there is some gas takeaway being built, but there's still gonna be that time frame where operators are kind of stuck. And we've had significant reduction in flaring, um, in flaring over the last two years. There's going to be more and more political pressure, social pressure for these companies to stop flaring and actually sell this gas, especially when gas is worth eight to $9 in MCF. You don't wanna be flaring tens of thousands of dollars away every single day possibly uh, on some of these gassy wells. So another headache that they have to deal with. And who are the biggest culprits? The private producers. They have been out here away from the public eye flaring upwards of 13% of their gas. The top publics are at 0.25% or lower. Uh, so there's going to be more and more focus here. The commission is going to clamp down. There's going to be social pressure to get this uh, gas into the pipeline, stop flaring, stop emitting, and it's going to impact the, uh, yeah, it's, 
it's definitely going to impact the the kind of the production slash growth rate um, going forward. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, gas oil ratios rising. It's a slow rise, and where is it? Where is this going? We'll see. But if the gas oil ratio rises for the same amount of oil production, you are now producing way more gas. Have people built gas takeaway capacity expecting this? I don't think so. So there's a second uh, change here. And, and yeah, Dave, you make a great point. Um, David, tier two versus tier one. Tier two wells are just gassier. Shale is basically oily gas wells. It's not gassy oil wells, uh, especially as you go into tier two, tier three. Um, we can see the quality degradation from this one chart. Um, okay, who's doing the flaring? Private producers in non-core areas. Why? Because A, they stay out of the public eye, and B, the non-core areas don't have the gas takeaway capacity. So as, as these private producers, they wanna produce more, they wanna jack up rigs, they don't have the infrastructure in these fringe non-core areas. And they can do it for a bit. They can start flaring these massive amounts until somebody catches on and they are catching on. And they're gonna say, hang on a sec. Like this is not gonna be accepted here. You, you're wasting our resource. You're contributing to emissions and basically wasting, wasting gas. Um, so watch for this. Another issue, reserves. The US doesn't have the reserves that they say they do. They can. They say they have 40 years, we can supply the world, we can do this, we can do that. Um, not really, no. They consume slash produce, no, they produce almost 10% of their annual, of their reserves on an annual basis. Compared to Kuwait, 1%, Iraq, 1.5%, Canada, 1%, Saudi Arabia, 2%, you know, Libya, all this, Russia, 4%. They're using up way more of the reserve. So they cannot sustain even current production for the so many years that Rystad claims, let alone a higher production, a higher growth production. So when you see CEOs of Diamondback, uh, Pioneer, uh, Exxon, and all these coming out and saying, look, we don't want to increase production because if we increase production, we can't sustain it for the years that we want to sustain it for. This is exactly what they're talking about. They don't have the reserves. If you're, if you're producing 10% of your reserves in a year at today's production, and you increase production over three years by let's say 15% a year, so you end up increasing 50% compounded, now you only have six years of reserve left, not 10 years, because you're producing 15% of your reserve every year, not 10%, okay? And people love their jobs, people love their share-based compensation and their large packages, and they love the oil industry, they love working in it, they love drilling wells. They wanna keep this going for a longer time. Why, why make this, this curve even steeper and then you have this massive decline staring you in the face on the other side? Um, and here is the root of all problems. The US Geologic Society in 2017 fooled the world, whether it was by them wanting to do that or they just had poor models, uh, whether it was on purpose, we, we don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is they said, this is the Northwest shelf of the Permian and this is the central basin of the Permian. This is just the Delaware Basin, uh, the Midland Basins over here. But they said, all this place has productive oil. Fair enough, okay. How do we know if that's true or not? We have five years of drilling activity. That tells us exactly where the oil is and exactly where the oil isn't. And that's these blue and green drills. Each line is an individual well. You see they've gone outside the core here. They must have not found oil. 
or found fringe oil, so they didn't exploit it. Okay, so if the USGS came out and said, this is 40 years of reserve in this box here, okay? We only have half of that, less than half in reality. So that gets cut down to 20 years. Along with that, the wells are not tier one all over the place. So now that gets cut down to 15 years of reserve. And this was 2017. We already produced five years of it. We have only 10 years of reserve left, not 40. And the world is still fooled. They still think, you know, I still see on Twitter, I still see on forums that the US has 40 years of shale reserve and they can just produce themselves. This is gonna hit people in the face like a brick wall, like a, like a just a runaway train. It, the, the difference is so drastic between what they think and what is, you can't just cover these things up. It's, it's just too far. It's just too much difference between that. Um, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you, David. I, I will check that out as well. Um, okay, so let's talk about wells themselves. So I'm gonna make a point here that I think is going to get the whole thesis exactly uh, proven right here. Number one, the well productivity is not increasing. Despite longer wells, despite more propent, despite better technology, despite better seismic data, the wells are not getting any better. We saw 2016 right here had the best wells, then 17, then 18, then 19, then 20, then 21. The wells are not only flat, they're actually declining in productivity. So this is not obvious until we go into the later stages of the well, like two to three years down the road. So people will come out with these news releases. We have these massive wells, we have these huge IP rates, blah, blah, blah. And it comes on, fine. Well, 12 months down the road, 24 months down the road, the real geology, mother nature takes over. She says, look, you tried to fool these guys, but I literally don't have the oil to produce here that you were producing in 2016. You, you made these wells way too long. You fracked it with way too much intensity that you had massive upfront rates. And after that, the productivity is just declining massively. Okay, point number one. And the data is here to show it. I'm not making this up. This is all the wells ever drilled in the Permian uh, horizontal wells. This graph here and the point I'm gonna make here, um, which is I think will kill any, anyone talking about growth, will just, I think go against all that. So let's look at January 1st, 2018, okay? The Permian was producing roughly 2,300 barrels a day, January 1st, 2018. That's all the wells that were drilled from 2008 to December 31st, 2017. Not drilled, but on production. All those wells combined were making 2.3 million barrels a day, okay? In one year, that legacy production went down to about 1,200 barrels 1.2 million barrels a day. So you had declines of 1.1 million barrels on the legacy production. However, shale was doing really well and they were able to grow production in that one year to a total production of 3.5 million. So they grew production from 2.3 to 3.5. That's 1.2 million barrels a day of growth. Awesome. Plus, they made up for the 1.1 of declines. So they actually added 1.2 plus 1.1. They added 2.3 million barrels of fresh production that year. Awesome. Of that, only 1.2 was growth. Now let's shift one year forward. We're now producing 3.5 million barrels. It's January 1st, 2019. This production in one year went, 
went from 3.5 to about 1700. So the legacy production declined 1.8 million barrels now. Instead of 1.1, it declined 1.8. But shale was amazing. They still added about, um, call it 800,000 barrels of extra production. So they made up for the 1.7 or 1.8 of natural decline, and they added 700,000. So they added on aggregate 2.5 million barrels. But when we looked at one year previous, of the 2.3 that they added, 50% went to decline mitigation, 50% went to growth. Now, because the production is way higher and we have more declines, 1,700 went to decline mitigation, 800 went to growth. Only 25% roughly was the growth. Remember, this is better acreage. Back in the day, this is with 800 to 900 rigs running. This is with the DUC inventory building, just better wells in, in general right here. We see them. 2017, 2018, 2019, these were better wells. And then COVID kind of screwed everything up because one could make a case that late 2019 was when this was really peaking. And how do we know that? Let's look at the production again, one year later. We were producing 4,300 as of January 1st, 2020. That legacy production declined in one year to about 2,200. So 2.1 million barrel of decline mitigation required. You see what the problem is? That even if you have the same amount of rigs, if your production base is higher, more and more of, the, of your new fresh wells on production are going towards decline mitigation, not towards growth. So with the Permian at roughly, call it, 4.5, 4.7 million barrels today. If we go one step further, this chart shows you exactly what's happening. So because your production base is higher, this is, I think, uh, Permian plus Eagle Ford, I wanna say. Uh, you're now spending more and more of your fresh production on decline mitigation, which means even if you have the same number of rigs, even if you, have, if you have the same number of frac fleets, your growth is just going to be way lower because a lot more is going towards decline mitigation. That's, that's it. That completely collapses anyone who's going to come here and tell me about a million barrel a day growth for the next five years. Because if you grow this another million barrels a day this year and next year, you have an, an extra 600,000 of decline mitigation you have to do the following year. So now instead of decline mitigating 2.2, now you gotta do 2.8 and then the next year 3.4. You need an extra 200 rigs, 300 rigs to maintain those levels of production and growth that you're looking for. Plus an extra 75 to 100 frac fleets. I just showed you, we're not even at pre-COVID levels of frac fleets or rigs. So, I believe, and I'm gonna put this out there, that not only has shale peaked in 2019, not only are you not gonna get a million barrels a day this year or next year or the year after, even if the supply chain eases, you might get a million barrels a day combined ever, ever to the peak of shale. It is in its peak phase slash almost there. And it's not only are they gonna have trouble growing, they're gonna have trouble decline mitigating 2.7 to 3 million barrels every damn year. And that's the way I see shale. That's the way a lot of people are not, are not looking at it. They, see, they say the same amount of rigs, the same amount of frac fleets, we should be able to grow a million every year. Not with unconventional. With conventional reservoirs, maybe. But with unconventional, with these heavy declines, not possible. So let me make the case even stronger here. The Midland Basin declines. 
okay? The first year decline has remained relatively stable. The second year decline is accelerating. The third year decline is accelerating. Fourth, fifth, sixth. The decline percentages are accelerating. What does that mean? That means when we compared this year, these were 2017 wells. When they were three years down the road, okay, they were declining at roughly 15% a year. Okay, so we have roughly a million barrels that's declining at 15% a year. That's 150,000 barrels. The latest wells are gonna decline at 25% a year. So instead of 150,000, it's gonna be 250,000 of this is gonna decline, of this million barrels. However, it's not just 250 because the wedge is way bigger. So now this wedge coming to, let's say three years down the road is maybe 1.2 million barrels. You take 25% decline rate on that. It now went from 150,000 to 300,000 decline. And the, these things are not obvious yet because not many wells from 2018, 2019, 2020 are yet in this like three to four year decline phase, but they're gonna get there and the declines are gonna be higher, which means you must bring more and more production, fresh production online to mitigate these declines, which means your growth is gonna be even lower with the same amount of rigs and frack fleets Plus your well quality is degrading in general. So where is the growth here? Where, where are you showing me the million barrels a day of Permian growth, of shale growth, et cetera? Here's your shale decline. I don't wanna talk about it much, but I'm just comparing it to conventional reservoirs and why it's easier to keep the Gulf of Mexico production flat slash grow the Brazilian production um, some of the Alaska, Mexican fields, <coughs> excuse me, um, et cetera. And yeah, so David makes a great point here. There are going to be companies that that company in particular can increase production, but I'm talking on the aggregate of the entire field slash basin and in an oil supply demand going forward perspective. Um, so there's this, okay. Um, Permian supply, like I said, the wells are not as good. We're seeing increased water production. We're seeing increased water oil ratios, which means for every one barrel of oil produced, they used to produce two water with it. Then they produce three water with it. Now there's wells producing up to five barrels of water for every one oil. This water has to be cleaned, disposed. It has to be you need the takeaway capacity for it. So you need bigger pipelines. So there's more problems there on the infrastructure perspective. Um, when we look at Permian supply on a overall basis, so they said productivity was increasing per well. How? Because they basically kept drilling longer wells and jamming more propent into it. They are putting 20 million pounds of sand into each well. Just try and visualize that. 20 million pounds as in weight of sand into each well. They're putting down like 10, tens of thousands of cubes, so cubic meters of water into each well. This is a technology on a completely different level. It is a scientific miracle that you're even able to extract oil out of shale. So longer wells, more propent, what does it mean? That means when you normalize the wells for lateral length, productivity is down 18% since 2016. We already knew this because we looked at this chart earlier, but shown more graphically, not well-focused, but from a technology standpoint. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it would be the same as if, if, you, if you started working 14 hours a day instead of working eight hours a day and you said, wow, my paychecks are looking good. Yeah, because you're working way more. Like 
let's bring it back down to what you made per hour and you're down 18%. Um, so, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, we have seen uh, many quarters of negative growth. So shale is in a recession for sure. Um, so same thing, just broken down, not just Permian, broken down by Texas and New Mexico. Uh, Texas flatline for a while, New Mexico is down a little bit more. New Mexico has better wells. Uh, this is Permian supply. The exact same thing I just mentioned, the productivity enhanced or expected ultimate recovery, barrels per thousand feet. It's been flat for six years in a row and declining now. This is the Midland Basin flat for basically ever and now showing signs of slight decline. And when I say slight decline, this is huge. A 10% or a 5% change in your expected ultimate recovery over thousands of wells, over all this production, 5% on 5 million barrels, 250,000 extra. I know that's not what the chart is saying, but just to conceptualize that, visualize it. So here's Permian oil production, uh, real time. This is real time based on the pipelines that are out in the field. See how they're, they're really struggling despite all the additions. I mean, this is 2021, how much have they grown? 200,000. This also includes conventional production. How much has conventional grown in the Permian? Maybe 200,000. Are we flat year over year in shale? Quite possibly. Um, look at the growth in 2019, from 4 million to 5 million, million barrels a day. You will never see this again. And it just has to do with what I just said, the decline rates of a higher production level. Uh, top operators in the Permian, basically the growth is coming out of two companies, Mewborn Oil, right here, purple, and uh, where is it? and Endeavor Energy right here, red. Two private companies are basically the growth. You have Exxon Mobil growing a bit, but while Exxon is growing, Occidental has lost 100,000 100, barrels in a year. And ConocoPhillips is down 50,000 barrels in six months. So we gotta look at things again on a field level, not just what one company is doing. And we don't see, if you add up these top 15, there's not much growth that's happened. I mean, these are acquisitions. So Pioneer bought out Parsley, I believe. And that's where this comes from. Oxy bought out. Yeah, they bought out the company that, that got in bidding war with Chevron. Uh, I forget the name now. Um, and the Permian Basin is, is kind of the growth engine. Uh, it, it produced 43% of oil uh, earlier this year. So if the Permian is flatlining slash peaking, the entire US production is flatlining slash peaking and possibly in decline. These are the latest wells out of the Midland Basin. So Midland, Odessa area, you know, you might think, wow, these are not bad wells. The, the, the IP24, again, IP24 is gonna be the best trade the well is ever gonna produce because it's the top, it's the first 24 hours of a well going on production. And you might say not bad, you know, wells, 1,300 barrels a day, 900 barrels a day. That's only the top, the top wells. There are, there's more than half the wells are producing less than 900 barrels a day. And if you just want to run some quick math, take 900 barrels a day, put an 80% decline on it for year one, calculate the number of barrels it will produce in that year, multiply it by net back of $60, $70 US, I bet you these wells don't even pay out. If they cost seven, eight, 10, $12 million to drill and complete, I bet you these wells don't even pay out. As in, they don't even generate their cost of capital back. Uh, and these are solid companies, Endeavor, CrownQuest, Earthstone, Pioneer. These are not junk, you know, junk companies that are drilling garbage out in the middle of nowhere. This is legit stuff in Midland County, Martin, um, you know, some of these other lower grade counties. 
Oh, there's a lot of Midland in here, I see. Uh, so where's the, where are the actual good wells? They're in two counties, Leah and Eddie, that's it. This, this New Mexico area has been the growth engine. It's the only place in the Permian where if you took it on its own, you can actually see growth. Why? Look at their wells. They're coming on at 3,000 barrels a day, 5,000 barrels a day. Like this is top quality tier one stuff that Oxy and Cotera are drilling. Um, Exxon Mobil and Chevron have a lot of acreage in these areas that is undrilled. So the day Exxon Mobil says, we're going flat out drill baby drill in Leah and Eddy counties. Yeah, you could expect a little bit of growth, 200,000 barrels, big deal. Meanwhile, the rest of your field is declining and they can't drill good wells. Um, here's the Permian, a little bit more on the visual side. So the best counties, Leah, Eddy, see how big they are. Uh, Reeves, Loving, here's Midland. Midland up 10 are pretty good. Martin, uh, Picos maybe. This all gassy areas. So, and this is all basically fringe, you know, not, not good stuff. So this is the core of the core. Uh, and you're seeing more and more companies drill in like weird counties that I've never heard of, you know, Chavez, Joe Mill, and uh, hang on, no, here, um, Orion and um, Chavez and all this. So keep an eye out for that. When the rigs are, not only are the rigs not good, but if you're deploying them in these junk, you know, lower quality tier three, tier four counties, your wells are not gonna be good. Right? It's just the way things work. Uh, Eagleford, you see, you see the exact same problem. They were able to grow from a lower production base. As the production base got higher, the decline rates just got way too much for them to handle. And this field is forever peaked in basically flat to perpetual decline um, for the near future. Uh, so again, it's not just Permian, the Eagleford had the same issue three years earlier, four years earlier. And we see it, I mean, look at it. They, yeah, they got to peak, they dropped, they were still able to grow, but how much? 100,000 barrels a year. And then it went down to 50, big deal. That's not the million barrels a day that the world is, is expecting for the next eight years uh, compounding on top of each other. It's uh, pretty bizarre how you can put out forecasts like that. I mean, something has to significantly change in the technology or the well quality or some sort of amazing science uh, that comes out that can massively increase recovery factors. Um, you know, for those who are not familiar with shale, go online and look up the shale rock itself, and then picture us producing oil from it. It is a miracle that we're even able to do this in the first place. Um, Eagleford production, we saw some growth this year, but look at the declines. The, when, when they have weeks where they don't bring wells on production, it can decline like 100,000 barrels in three weeks. Look at this decline here. It fell 100,000 barrels in two weeks. Uh, so definitely Eagleford is gone. We see more and more wells are zero barrels, abandonment candidates, less than 10 barrels, less than 25 barrels. It adds to production cost. It adds to abandonment cost. It adds to your operating cost. So your, your break evens go up. Uh, people don't wanna produce and you still gotta abandon these wells at some point. There, there's gonna be more and more talk about all these shale wells and conventional oil wells in the US sitting all over the place, um, not being properly regulated to some extent. I'm not saying over-regulate everything, no, but to some extent. Uh, counties, I talked about counties in the Permian. Look at the difference in counties in the Eagleford. The DeWitt and Carnes are way better, like two and a half times better, three and a half times better, than the fifth best county in the Eagleford. That's how big the drop off is between a tier one, a tier two, a tier three, tier four, et cetera. Where have people been drilling for the last five years? DeWitt and Carnes and Gonzalez. Where have they been drilling in the Permian? 
Midland, Loving, Reeves, Leah, Eddie. What happens when these, when these counties become less and less productive? You're now taking a huge step down in well quality. Are we there yet? Yeah, in some places, yeah. Is it gonna accelerate? Yeah. What does it mean for shale growth? With the same number of rigs or even more rigs going, you need three LaSalle wells to equal one DeWitt well. Do you see the rig count three Xing in the next five years? Probably not. Same thing in the Eagleford in terms of oil production. Conoco and Marathon have way better production than EOG and Murphy, than Callan and Chesapeake. If you talk about Chesapeake ramping up rigs in the Eagleford, big deal. Their wells are not even half as good as Conoco and Marathon. Permitting, another issue. This is not a latest graph, but there's permitting issues now where there's not enough permits out there. People are getting a lot more permits, but I'm not seeing anything where there's a massive ramp up of drill baby drill mentality. Not, not yet. I haven't seen it in, in the refracts. I haven't seen it in the new drills. I haven't seen it in re-entries. It's all just a slow growth back to these levels here. Um, Eagle for supply again, no real company that's increasing production. A lot of them are in decline. These little ones don't even matter. If they double production, it would be 30,000 extra. Big deal. Again, Eagle Ford here. Um, where is the production from? I just said, where have they been producing for the last five years? Right here. Here's Carnes. Uh, what was the top one? Uh, DeWitt. So uh, DeWitt right here in, or in, in orange here. You see DeWitt kind of already peaked and it's, it's not going down. Carnes is kind of the new one and it's, it, it has peaked already and declining. The pictures speak for themselves. Here's the Bakken, same exact thing. Um, not much I have to add here. The Bakken oil production is flat. Bakken declines. This is what's gonna end up. The Bakken is about five to seven to 10 years more mature than the Permian. Even the first year decline rates are accelerating. Second year decline rates are accelerating. Run this over the entire production and the Bakken will never hit this number ever again. Um, keep this in mind. This is very, very important. These acceleration of decline rates, 5% here, another 5% here, another 3% here, the wells end up being much worse um, over, the, uh, over the long run. Um, what is this? This is, I believe this is the Bakken again. There's two companies that have good wells here, Devon and Marathon. The drop off to the third best producer is just massive and it just goes down from there. The company is drilling the most wells, the thickest bars here, Continental, Whiting, Hess. Not, they're not good wells. They're, compared to the top of the top, they're, they're not that good. It's, it's just cookie cutter, basic mid tier stuff. So, they're never gonna be able to increase production um, to the same extent. And um, yeah, so this is a great point by Beth here. So there are technologies coming out for enhanced oil recovery, refracts, CO2 injection, uh, gas injection, water flooding, et cetera, et cetera, um, which is helping in some cases, but I would have to see something really concrete that works on a larger scale before we can say it's gonna make any sort of massive impact. You know, you can have a well here or there, you increase production on. I've run chemical programs on asphaltine, heavy wax wells that can increase production, but they're either uneconomic because the extra production you get doesn't justify the cost or they just don't work in all cases. Uh, but yeah, great point. Something that I watch for a lot. My, a lot of my discussions these days are around What's the new technology? What, what is coming in that can affect my thesis here? That's what I talk about a lot with a lot of people in service companies, in ENPs, in uh, just across, across the oil industry. Gas oil ratios in the Bakken. If you want a sneak peek of what's, 
what's going to happen to the Permian. This only goes till 2017. And you see how once it rises, it continues rising. Uh, Bakken production profiles, here's 2021 in light blue. You see how it's declining way faster. It's, it's right here, this thin blue line. Um, declines are real. You can't, you can't go to a well, talk to it nicely and expect it to start not declining. Believe me, when I used to operate wells, I, I bust my head on this problem. We had cardium wells that would decline and I would just try all sorts of things to mitigate these declines. You can't argue with mother nature. You can't argue with geology. You can't argue with engineering reservoirs, but they are what they are. Um, how many, I think we've got 15 slides or so left. So uh, we'll get to it. So again, declines in the Bakken, the top producers, nobody's really ramping up. We got uh, Grayson Mill Energy here, some small privates that are increasing, but they're gonna run into the same problem. They can increase from 25,000. What happens when they get to 75 or 50? Now they have more declines to deal with. So their growth flat lines. Uh, more and more inactive wells in the Bakken. There's about 20,000 of them now. Uh, as a percentage of total wells, you're seeing more and more abandonment candidates, extra cost, extra work. Uh, earthquakes, there's more and more earthquakes happening in the Permian Basin. Underground water disposal at extremely high rates, at extremely high pressure. 1.5 billion barrels a quarter is being disposed. Uh, about 15 to 20 million barrels a day has to be disposed, injected deep underground. It's causing earthquakes in the disposal areas. Some of the areas have already cut down. They've put limits. They've said, no, you can't inject into this zone. There's producers having to add extra casing strings uh, in the shallow disposal zones. The data speaks for itself. You can argue this all day long that it's not due to this, it's not due to that. I will agree with you, it's not due to fracking. It, it has nothing, very little to do with fracking. It has to do with water disposal at these sorts of volumes. Look up a map of where the injection wells are in the Permian and compare it to this map. It's gonna be exactly the same. Cumulative earthquakes above three, above three magnitude. You know, almost nothing, nothing, nothing as water disposal takes hold the graph has gone exponential. Number of seismic events, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Not only are you having more events, you're having more events of, of higher magnitudes. The ones that start crashing homes, the ones that start knocking down buildings, the one that start affecting people. Uh, same thing, basically. Um, this is the seismic, seismic response areas where they know there's injection activity. Look at where the bigger earthquakes are, okay? Um, the top earthquakes in, in West Texas ever, over the last 100 years, this is being tracked. Five out of the top 10 are in the last two years. 13 out of the top 20 are in the last two years. 12 of the top 20 are in the last year. The problem is getting worse. Kick the can down the road, ignore it. Call me a liar, call me a apologists, blah, blah, blah. I don't really care because the data speaks for itself. You're seeing more activity above four magnitude. It's in remote areas where nobody really cares. Fine. What happens when there's a five earthquake, when there's a six, when there's one in Midland where people live near Odessa? It's all future issues that you can choose to ignore or you can choose to somehow incorporate it it's not gonna be a massive hit, but look at this, the Oklahoma oil production and what happened with the earthquake seismic activity there. And you will get an idea of what could potentially happen. Bakken, here's your Bakken core. There's nothing left. There, there's really no place left. They've drilled in the rivers and the lakes all over the place. There's very few spots left. What is left is tier four and tier five right here. So you have one, two, three, not much left, tier four, tier five, basically trash. Stuff that probably isn't even economic until you get to 80, 85, $90 oil. 
and nobody's going to be tripping over themselves to drill these sorts of acreages. The refrock, people were talking about refrocks and people are going in and refracking wells. The refract wells are declining 81% in 11 months. Same exact problem. You're not fixing the source of the problem. You're, you're just refracking wells and then they, they decline even higher rates. Gas oil ratio in the Bakken rising. How much of total production in the Bakken is oil? How much is gas? These fields are gassing out. There's no two ways about it. There, there's more and more gas being produced, less and less oil. Um, I've talked about this a little bit before, but when I talked about that US Geological Survey map, the same thing is happening in every basin in America. It's not just the Permian. They've overestimated the basins in every single production area. This is the DJ Basin in Colorado. We have the EOG Wolf Camp wells. As you drill longer and longer wells, which we talked about, you get less and less recovery per lateral foot. Why? Because think about it, you're drilling four kilometers horizontally, three kilometers underground. The oil at the end of that well is just less likely to flow and come all the way flow that far down and be produced. So as the wells are longer, your reserves are actually shrinking because you're producing less per lateral foot. Um, I talked about companies putting lipstick on a pig. This is exactly what they've done. They've jacked up production, looking to sell, and then they say, uh-oh, we didn't sell. And now these wells, because they produced them irresponsibly, without chokes, without proper production operations methods, without you know, the proper uh, gas, um, gas takeaway, et cetera, they just flared them into surface, into atmospheric pressure. Now the decline rates are getting even worse on these 2021 wells yet to bite. The full impact of this is yet to be seen. Um, publics versus privates. People talk about private companies are jacking up rigs. They don't have the good acreage. They have in the Delaware Basin, they do, yes. In the Eagleford, they, the, the public acreage is 103% better. In Midland, 8% better. Uh, Powder River Basin is not a huge basin, not a big deal. In the Bakken, the public still have the better acreage. If we look at the maps, you see how the public companies are, dr are drilling in the core, whereas the private companies are on the edges. It's so easily visualized. Even I was surprised when I saw this, uh, this picture. The core and the non-core. Eagleford, you have the core, DeWitt and Carnes, the top counties, you have the non-core. And here's the oil production. The public companies are way better. The private companies produce more BOEs because it's all gas. They, all they're doing is producing gas with slight streaks of oil in it. Um, you see it here, way better oil production by the publics. The private companies have better total production, BOEs, mostly gas. Um, total ads over the last year, 46 vertical rigs have been added. 95% of them are from the private companies. They're adding rigs, but they're vertical rigs, drilling old school conventional wells, like stuff that doesn't even make sense. And in the horizontal side, they have the cheaper, junkier rigs, less powerful rigs. So the private companies, even if they are getting more rigs, it's gonna take them longer to drill. They can't drill as deep. They can't drill as good quality wells. They're suffering. The public companies have taken the big, big daddy rigs, uh, the big shale deep rigs for themselves. <clears throat> So growth, ExxonMobil just reported 2Q. Their production is about the same as it was in third quarter of 2021. Chevron just reported 2Q. Liquids production, only 30,000 quarter over quarter, big deal. The two companies on the private side to watch for, Mewborn and Endeavor. They both, no, Mewborn reports production based on these JP Morgan graphs, 
Endeavor actually reports production every quarter. They're gonna report August 11th or so. Watch for these. These two are the big, big growth producers in the private side. But have they hit their peak as well? You know, they grew, look at this, about 70,000 in, in uh, three quarters. And then it was only 10,000. And they spent $600 million in capital in one quarter in 1Q22. So if these two flatline on the private side, I am basically convinced that shale, like I'm, I'm already convinced that shale is basically peaked, maybe that small growth wedge. But if these two peak on top of that, you're looking at serious problems just to sustain production going forward um, into the future. And here's a trick that ExxonMobil and Chevron used. They said, we're gonna go grow production by 25%. You can read that right now. If you Google Chevron production increase, that's exactly what they said in BOEs. So in October, 2019, Exxon produced 320,000 BOEs, 66% was oil. Two years later, they produced about 500,000 BOEs. So 60% uh, growth, the oil growth, was only 30%. Only 56% of their production is now oil. Gas growth doesn't really scare me. I'm not worried. I'm worried about oil growth. And these companies are misleading investors. They're saying we're growing production, but it's BOE. It's not oil. Downward revisions, they have already started. People are slowly and slowly, they're late to the party or I am potentially early to the party, if I'm correct. There's already downward revisions happening. We see expected ultimate recoveries go down by 9%, 7% in the Bakken, 15%. We see oil cuts changing, meaning the percentage of oil of the total production down 5%, down 5%. And production changing. JP Morgan brought down 2022 production by 500,000 barrels a day, finally. They finally capitulated and they changed their model about a month ago. They also brought down 2023 production by 300,000 barrels a day. So they're not quite ready to say that the growth is done, but they're slowly and slowly gonna agree with this thesis because the data speaks for itself. You can't argue with data, science, geology, and reservoirs and decline rates. Slow, it's gonna take time. Nobody's gonna suddenly say, oh yeah, shale has peaked. Nobody is gonna to agree to this. It's gonna take six months, a year, 18 months, 24 months. And if you're an oil bull, you believed in the structural bull cycle anyway, with this information, I think there's a case to be made that this is not gonna just be a structural bull cycle. This is gonna be an absolutely crazy, crazy bull cycle here where you will have to see demand destruction on the order of worldwide recession to mini depression levels to bring the market back into balance. Not today, but as the cycle continues, unless there's some other source of supply. Um, and maybe this is a good time to mention, I do go over the other supply that's coming online in my April 30th macro. I wanted this one to be focused more on shale, but if you wanna look at the other countries, please check out the April 30th macro. And I talk about Guyana, Venezuela, Iran. I talk about Indian demand going up, Chinese demand going up, um, all, all sorts of other stuff. And renewables, I talk about EVs. I talk about the economy, the general economy, et cetera. Um, that's more on that one. Um, okay, so. I think we're just about done here. So we got, here's the rig counts of the major players with the best acreage left. Chevron, Conoco, Diamondback, Oxy, EOG, Devon, Pioneer, and Exxon. None of them look like they're in any rush to increase production. Conoco has gone up because they acquired Shell. In December, they acquired Shell's premium acreage. So the rigs kind of look like they're going up. Everyone else, they don't care, owes a hundred bucks. They don't care, it's $120, could not care less. 
we don't see any drill baby drill. And these eight companies have the best remaining Permian acreage aggregated between them. As long as they're not firing up rigs, you could even make a case that shale is shale production might actually start to decline uh, as things go on here. And you don't see it. Chevron and Exxon have done absolutely nothing in the Delaware Basin, which is where those three to 5,000 barrel wells are. Other companies, Shell, BP, Total, Eni, Equinor, Repsol, combined 13 million barrels of oil equivalent per day, not growing. This is the latest information based on their latest releases. So it's not just fail, it's a worldwide issue here. Uh, companies are not feeling confident to invest in production with the regulations, with the social pressures, with the political pressures. They'll just sit there and rake in money. They, they tried to proactively increase production. They, believe me, they tried. They tried from 2016 to 2018 to 2020. They tried. U.S. shale came and screwed everything up and now is not going to be the savior on the other side. Um, so we'll let this cycle play out a bit. Uh, I think we have two or three more slides here. So I want to talk about this quick. People were talking about the paper markets and what's the issue, what's going on. Here's what's going on. As commodities become more volatile, okay, up and down due to, you know why, there's too much, there's too much narrative, there's too many politicians involved, they want to knock down the price of oil, they want to uh, try to control the market, they're making it very volatile, okay. Here is the normal distribution that's being used by banks, by paper traders, etc. What they're seeing is as the price goes up into the 120 range, the potential losses are way higher on the on the negative side. Why? Because if oil is at 120 and they're running a downside model of 90 to 130, you have way more downside here. The model may or may not be correct. I don't think it's correct, but that's not up to me. Uh, I need to explain what's happening. So there's more and more downside possibility, which means when you run an expected value on this sort of normal curve, the value at risk goes way higher. Your loss in a tail risk scenario goes up exponentially. What does that mean? That means they can hedge or buy contracts for less barrels, which is why you see the open interest in crude, in Brent, in products is down about 15 to 20 to 30%. This explains it right here. The way the, oil, the banks and the paper traders work, they work like a casino. They're not looking to make money on the, on the contract. They're, they're trying to get the 2% or the 3% off every transaction and basically collect money off that. But when they see their risk of losing money on the contract gets too high, all they can do is hedge a lower number of barrels, which is ironic because it drives up volatility. It makes the commodity even more volatile when you have less participants in the market and you have less flexibility around how many barrels you can buy. And this explains the whole thing, which is why you will likely see every time crude go to 120, until these models change, you will see a paper market effect. It may already have been flushed out because the contracts are already down. It may have been flushed out, but definitely something to watch for, okay? People talking about liquidity issues, people talking about issues with contracts, those issues are not at $90 oil. They're not at $100 oil. Those issues are at $120 oil. And that's why I think the range of sensitivities that people are running should be maybe adjusted a little bit higher 
but again, that's just one person's opinion, one man's opinion, and you're free to do as you wish. Um, but this is why I will always, currently, the way the macro is set up, I will run my models at a minimum 85 and a maximum upwards of 150 based on what I see uh, on that positively skewed normal distribution curve. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, the finale, this was where we were in April. Oil XLE was up 37%. Tech was down 18.5%. That's April 30th. Today is three months to the day. <clears throat> Since then, energy is up 7%. Tech is up 2%. So for all the volatility that us oil investors have suffered through, we have still generated alpha in the last three month period over not just tech, but every single sector that is shown here and still continues to be only one of two sectors in the green. The other utilities is only up 5%. Energy is up 44% uh, year to date. So, and that's with every person, their dog, their grandma, their cousin, trying to talk down the price of oil, talking about recession, people with hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter, people on Bloomberg, people on CNBC saying we're suffering a massive demand destruction, we're suffering recession, oil is done, we're short selling oil, blah, 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 blah. It's still 44% up, up year to date. It's still, well, the oil price today is still above $98 a barrel with Joe Biden tweeting about gasoline prices every damn day and releasing the last final bullets out of his chamber, which once they're done, what happens? What happens? And that's exactly why I invest in the oil sector. I invest to hit home runs and hit grand slams. And that's how I run my portfolio. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, that's the case I like to get across in these macro outlooks. Um, again, this is not investment advice. This is my opinion. This is the way I construct my portfolio. This is the way I look at my risk tolerance. This is the way I look at reality and data. I don't care about narratives. I could not care less about narratives. You telling me uh, this is happening, that's happening. If there's not data to back it up, there's no point even discussing it. So that's that. Um, a big thank you to everyone who joined. I know it can get long and technical at times. Uh, but I believe it's the time required to get the point across, to get the data across, to get the proper information across what I'm seeing from my perspective, why I'm so, so bullish on things going forward here. Um, we're about two, uh, two and a half hours in, so maybe I'll take a few questions uh, for a few minutes here, um, but I do want to end it uh, pretty shortly. Uh, once again, a big thank you to everyone. Uh, who's not going to stay for the Q&A period, but always appreciate your time. Uh, this has been an awesome journey uh, of the whole White Thunder thing ever since I joined Twitter. Uh, big thanks to Sohaib, obviously, for, for getting me on here, um, you know, giving me feedback, giving me ideas as to what's going on, and uh, sharing the, some of the stuff, some of the work. And to everyone who emails me, sends me feedback, sends me suggestions, um, this is what makes it happen. So uh, can't thank you enough. We'll take some questions here. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure, Beth. I, I am watching every technology closely, whatever's coming up. Uh, I saw one that they were pumping, and this is strange, but they were pumping like literally bombs down into the old vertical wells and refracking wells. I met with their CEO. I, I've talked about, uh, other technologies, polymer flooding, CO2, everything is on top of my mind because what killed the thesis in 2014 was American shale, a random technology that doesn't even make sense from a science perspective that came online to that degree. So I am, trust me, I'm watching very closely for any increases in production somewhere and that technology being able to be applied on a massive scale. Uh, but yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Plexus, I'm not familiar with this company, KK, but I do, I have used 
technologies in the past that eliminates gas leaks and oil leaks of pump jacks, ESPs, um, PCPs, etc. So um, I don't really think that would change the oil supply demand thesis in any way. So uh, yeah, it's just a leak mitigation, which is great. That's awesome. We want that. Uh, thoughts on how surge is looking given the recent earnings? I think this earnings was, was pretty well forecasted. We knew there was gonna be hedging loss. We knew most likely we were not gonna see a dividend increase. We knew they were spending a lot of capital. So the production was gonna slowly ramp up. So we saw 500 barrels a day, quarter over quarter. I know Q1 had that fire incident. So we have to take that into account, but I think everything is looking great. This company, I'm just gonna sit on it. It's a patient company. We're gonna see the dividend increase over the year. Uh, accumulating to a double or more by December. They're going to delineate more of the multi-leg uh, horizontals in the Sparky. They drilled an awesome well in Valhalla. They're capitalizing Mount Bastion. The hedges are rolling off, have rolled off, and there's more hedges rolling off into next year. Um, as it gets to a billion dollar company, I think there's going to be more funds and people that can get in, um, especially if the dividend gets higher. And I'd be looking for them to continue buying up land acreages, looking at bolt-on acquisitions, and potentially funding it by selling some of the sparky acreage that is un undelineated. So some of the stuff that maybe a new company wants to come in, they think they can use multi-leg horizontals there. They might sell it. They might do a farm in. They might get some money just from the, the free cash flow. And... Uh, you know, they, they specifically said once they get to 200 million debt, the 25% is used for share buybacks and acquisitions. And that ends up being roughly uh, somewhere between 60 to $80 million a year. And you can buy a lot of stuff for, for that sort of a value, whether it's land sales, whether it's, you know, 500 barrels here, 1,000 barrels there. Uh, I don't think it's a bad time to be buying things at two times cash flow, maybe three times free cash flow. Um, I think this is a good time going into this cycle. You may never get this opportunity uh, again. Um, so Meg has taken a beating. Yeah, for sure. Meg, Meg's been taking a beating for her a while. Like even before it, it jumped to 24, it was stuck for a long, long time in this 17 to $18 range. And, you know, the, the thing with a company like Meg is once somebody big starts buying in, it's going to move fast. There's not that many shares outstanding. They got the buyback slowly doing its thing. Uh, they got the debt pay down happening. There might be debt metrics that certain funds couldn't invest in. So once they fix that up, I think it's going to move fast. It's, it's going to move quite fast. Once, once the interest is there, once people realize what it is, once they realize what the real net asset value is, plus the free cash flow, um, it's going to move fast. You saw the same thing in, in Vermilion, right? It sat there forever and now it's up to a 52 week high. So in no time, it's up a dollar every single day. Uh, so stuff like this, I think we need to have a little bit of patience, um, not investment advice. I'm just saying what my opinion is. I think, uh, I'm definitely going to sit on this, uh, for a little bit. I, de I definitely think the value is there. And people are getting caught off guard. They're scared of this royalty thing, even though it's only a 10% move. It's not, it's not going from 5% to 40%. It's going from 10 to 15 range to a 20 to 25% range. Not, not a huge deal. Uh, but yeah, great point. Uh, Baytex up 100%. Yeah, I'm not following Baytex all that closely, but their, their uh, Pvine stuff is actually coming in really good. I think it's up to 9,000 barrels a day. It's, it's really good. And they have like 200 and some sections. They could really ramp up production there. They could sell their Eagleford, get a couple billion there, jack it all into the uh, P-Vine area, grow it to 30, 40,000 BOEs, barrels possibly. Um, and that probably ends up being a better company going forward. So maybe they do that, maybe they don't. Um, it's just not a name that I bought because of the hedging, hedging issue and into 2023. So yeah, uh, Seppo, 
you are, uh, you're going to get me in trouble here. So the Seppo says CEOs who are in their mid career would be smart to keep their fields producing as long as possible at sustainable rates for their own benefit, as well as the shareholders. So basically not increasing production. Uh, yeah, they're not going to say that. They're not going to say that, but it's, it's job security. If you can produce a field at 80, 90, hundred dollar oil for 15 years, for five, seven, 10 years, even get your checks, make money, party at Stampede, have fun, uh, drill some cool wells, do some wildcat drilling. Don't just increase production for the sake of it. That's what I would do. Yeah. I mean, I, I got a different take on things. I'm more of an aggressive kind of guy uh, looking at drilling and all this, but these companies on these 20 to 50 to 70 to 100,000 BOE companies, yeah, why bother? If you increase production, people are gonna be mad because your emissions went up and you're all this, you started polluting and your freshwater use went up. Why bother? You just sit there and when the time comes, uh, they'll beg for, for Canadian production. Uh, yeah, thanks so much everyone. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, you guys joining in or everyone joining in. Um, how much crude shipped to US via rail? I think we're down to 150,000 barrels. At the peak, we were at four, 450. We're down to about 150-ish. We have excess pipeline capacity. The only people using rail, I think, are those who are locked into long-term contracts. Uh, I would say today, the, the pipeline price is probably better unless you can find a way to, to ship your crude by rail directly to US Gulf Coast uh, pricing. You can blend it with something there and you can sell it as a premium grade possibly, but I think pipeline's more economic uh, right now. Uh, any updated company specific uh, results that you wanna call out? Not really, everything was pretty status quo. Uh, I gotta give white cap props. They were pretty restrained on capital and they put out a bunch of free cash flow that makes their debt look better after the XTO acquisition. So there's that. I think Vermilion is gonna have a banger of a quarter and they have the buyback ongoing. So I'm excited to see as July ends, kind of did they do any buyback? Uh, over the last little bit, because they might be the ones supporting the share price. Uh, don't forget, Vermillion only has 160 million shares outstanding. It's a very low float. So if they buy up a few of them, they could end up pushing the price up quite a bit. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to Spartan Delta and their Q2, um, how, how it came out, how the new wells came out. I'm looking forward to Crew and Kelt for the same reason. Uh, Advantages came out with an absolutely phenomenal quarter. So got to give them props. They also have the entropy uh, technology ongoing. So yeah, that, that team is top notch. What they're doing there is, is, is pretty good stuff. So uh, there's that and what else? Everything else was pretty status quo. I think Tamarack was pretty decent. Uh, White cap, we had Cardinal I think came out with a really good production number. So I got to give them props. Ever since Murray Edwards has gone involved, they've uh, done really, really well there. Um, nothing else really came out. I think ARC was pretty good. Um, it doesn't get me interested to buy them, but finally an FCF number that actually makes sense, maybe still a little bit too low. Um, Synovus, I think is having issues. Synovus is having issues just like Suncor is having with keeping their refining going, with production problems. Uh, I think, I think Synovus might have gotten too big for their own good. And again, it's early yet. They're still digesting the Husky assets. They're still dealing with refining and all this. So uh, maybe it's a bit early, but there might be a reason that CNRL doesn't buy downstream because it's just a headache. It's just a complete headache dealing with these refining issues. And you honestly don't make that much money on refining anyway, for the most part. It's only certain times when the crack spread blows out and you make a few dollars. Other than that, it's a complete headache. Uh, so, you know, maybe one to think about. I was thinking about buying refiners and maybe 
there's a case to be made with these integrated companies, but they're not really, they can't seem to keep their assets running. There is just always some problem uh, or the other. Uh, so Rako asks, I mostly have US shale producers, any Canadian number, names that are relatively cheap? Um, oh, this is an open-ended question if I ever saw one. Uh, yeah, like I, I can't advise you anything uh, Rako specifically, but I do have on my website, I have price targets uh, for about 55 companies that I track and they're not meant to be absolute price targets. They are in a way, but they're also meant to be relative price targets. So how much upside is there at certain commodity pricing environments from the current share price? So if you go to my website, whitetundra.ca, uh, you go to the price targets page, I think you can look at some companies that might fit your uh, upside slash downside potential at whatever commodity price you want to use. I think I have five prices right now, five or six. Uh, so that's where I can tell you to start. And I'm always happy to discuss on Twitter spaces or by email or call. You want to talk Canadian oil, um, any names that you, you, you shortlist, um, happy to talk about that anytime. Uh, yeah, so CO2 is going to be the next big thing for sure. CO2, you're going to see companies that have CO2 EOR potential absolutely destroy the performance if they can execute going forward. Um, the big thing, it's not going to add that much production. On an aggregate basis across North America, you could maybe add 200,000 barrels maybe 300,000 barrels. Um, there are some conventional fields in the Permian. Uh, I, I would like to make this point right now that Warren Buffett is not buying Oxy because it's an oil company. He couldn't care less. He's buying Oxy because Oxy is the only one realistically in the US that has a CO2 flood potential. They have these old Permian fields, I believe they have other conventional fields all over the place. And last I heard, they were buying huge acreages of land from lumber companies uh, because lumber companies have poor space rights in the USA. So you can actually inject CO2 into these poor spaces because it stays downhole. Um, you have to buy poor space rights. It's so weird how the US does these things, but. Anyway, it is what it is. So watch for that. The other thing is the recent bill that just came out that Joe Manchin proved, the carbon credits for CO2 injection specifically on long-term storage go from $35 a ton to $85 a ton. So I have never in the past been ever interested in US companies. Anytime something comes on my desk, I say, nope, not even interested. Uh, however, there are a couple companies that have CO2 flooding potential in the US uh, that, are, that have these old conventional reservoirs uh, that, that could be interesting to a investor looking for that. And I hate to keep this so mysterious, but I don't want to say companies and people go and buy them uh, tomorrow or Monday or Tuesday without, without looking into them. So there are companies out there that can do CO2 um, across North America. You know my ones that I, I own in Canada already, but on the overall supply demand of the world, it's not statistically important. Uh, and it's gonna take a lot of time. CO2 is corrosive. You need a CO2 source of enough volume and um, you might have to redo all your tubings. You might have to redo all your pipelines. You need approvals, you need the capital cost up front. Buying CO2 itself is expensive. So you need to believe in a 90 plus, 100 plus oil environment for the next five to seven years. And a lot of companies don't believe that. Um, how do you see the potential risk of a CO2 reduction movement? Oh, it's, it's great, it's awesome. When the Canadian government says we need you to reduce emissions by 40%, great. Awesome, why? There's only one source of long life, stable, 
production that can increase four, five, six million barrels a day in the next 10 years. That's the Canadian oil sands. If you put emission requirements on them, if you waste their time with excessive regulation, excessive CO2 reduction, these companies are already doing really good stuff with emission reduction, CO2 reduction. Um, the fields that I used to operate for modern resources up in Grand Prairie, we had solar running all our chemical pumps. We had solar running our, um, our injection side of things, our, all our um, well controllers, everything was running off solar and we got basically no credit for any of it. So things are being done behind the scenes. The oil industry is not this polluter guy who goes out and dumps oil all over the place. It's just complete wrong uh, interpretation. So I think the companies will get there. They will get government credits to get there and it stops Canadian supply from going bigger. How can I, how can I oppose that? From an from a oil investor, strictly oil investment perspective, facing or looking into a structural bull market, that's music to my ears. That's perfect. Uh, great. And don't forget the CO2 reduction, the five companies they've targeted are probably three to three and a half million barrels of Canadian production. So if you target something that big, they're not going to grow. In fact, they might even end up slowly flatlining slash declining production. Okay, any comments on MEG Q2? Not really. I think, again, everything was expected as usual. They're doing their buyback. They're doing their debt purchasing. We should hit the next target in, let me think here, probably September 15th or so, maybe, maybe late September. And at that point, they're going to go into buying roughly 6 million shares a month. So about 2% uh, share count reduction a month. Uh, people are making a big deal of this share-based compensation. The reason it looks bad is because they only started the, the share buyback recently. And those two numbers, uh, the share-based compensation and the buyback ended up being the same. But from now onwards, there's, there's not gonna be any share-based compensation and the share buyback is accelerating every quarter and it's gonna get even more in September. Great. Um, Vermilion acquisition. I don't know which Vermilion acquisition you're talking about. Lacrada's looking great at these pricing, the Montney is, it is going to be bid on. If you don't believe me, just wait. Companies that are in the Montney, like Crew, Spartan Delta, Hammerhead, Pipestone, with acreage, Kelt, they're not gonna sell for what their share price is trading at. So if you're saying they bought Lacrada for this, and I'm gonna compare it to a Crew or a Kelt, it's not the right comparison because you can't buy those companies at that pricing you will have to pay up and the market will slowly bake that in or they will get bought out at a pretty significant premium. Um, so love it. I love, I love Vermillion. My options are doing very well. And by December, I think they're going to do quite well, even better. Um, and they have so much inbuilt leverage built in. So pretty happy. Coreb is gonna close with a small free cash flow payment. After that, they're making five, six, seven hundred million dollars free cash flow a year or a quarter going into 2023. The hedges roll off on European gas. Um, yeah, before I get called crazy, I'll let I'll let people run their own free cash flow for 2023 um, until we get closer to the date a little bit. Your thoughts on journey? Yeah, it's great. I think they're buying low decline water floods. Awesome. I, I I have nothing against that. Companies are getting a little bit bigger. It's maybe marginally accretive at today's pricing, but they're gonna pay off over the long run. Um, great, if you want dividends, well, why are you buying Journey? There, there's many companies, there's Gear Energy, it's a very similar company that already pays a six, seven, eight percent dividend. Why are you expecting things from companies that specifically have said they're not gonna do that? And I'm not talking to you, Al, I'm just saying in general, if you want that sort of company, you can buy it on the market. It's, it's available. Uh, so anyone hating on acquisitions, there's plenty of companies you can buy that aren't doing acquisitions. Uh, so yeah, so be it. 
So that's about Petrotel. Not really, haven't been following. I know they're having some issues with protests and all this, but they, they have plenty of storage. So I'm not, I'm not really all that concerned, uh, to be honest with you, but I'm not following it that closely either. I don't think it's gonna enter my portfolio at this point. There's just too much social unrest problems and corruption in a sense, um, issues, issues with uh, the social fund and all this that are taken away from my money, from my free cash flow. Too much unknown, I guess. Uh, Synovus, yeah, the, you know, those are my thoughts. I think there's, there's a problem here occurring. They miss their free cash flow number that I come up with them every quarter. And it's always some random reason or missed margins, et cetera. Not a good sign. It's not a good sign. Um, can they properly digest the acquisition and get better? Possibly. They have one of the best management teams out there. They have one of the best acreages out there. You can't argue with those things, but the execution is just a little bit lacking in my opinion. Uh, for a company with this much refining exposure in Q2 to only put out a 2.3 billion free cash flow, um, not, not that good. I haven't checked the share base compensation, so uh, you'll have to forgive me on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, Energy Blogger, you hit the nail on the head, exactly. The decline rates globally are taken away from new additions. When people say, oh, Guyana is gonna be a million barrels in five years. Yeah, in five years, the world conventional oil would have declined by seven, eight, 10, 14 million barrels. Big deal that Guyana is at a million barrels. You need 14 Guyanas uh, in the next 10 years and we don't have them. We haven't found them. We're not putting enough money to exploration. So what's going to happen? There's going to be, like I said, the immovable force, which is, or the unstoppable force, which is global oil demand is going to meet the immovable object, which is world oil supply and plus inventories to be the mediator. And who's gonna win? It's gonna be demand uh, that has to go down uh, at some point this decade because supply, we just don't have supply. And if we have the supply, we're not investing enough time in a timely enough manner to uh, get there. Uh, did, for, did search front load, front end load CapEx? I don't, I don't really think so, no. I think it's pretty, pretty stable, maybe a few million here and there, nothing, nothing crazy. Uh, thoughts on I3 Energy? I'm just sitting and waiting. I'll, I'll let them do the work and drill good wells. The North Sea drill is coming up in September-ish. So I look forward to that. And in the meantime, I collect my monthly dividend which at, at my cost basis is like a 14 or 15% dividend or some. And I just chill out. There's no reason for me to sell I3. There's no reason for me to buy I3. I, I have a big enough stake. And uh, yeah, I love companies like this because when I have a low, low buy-in price, they're paying a solid dividend and I have upside potential still where the risk reward is, is still skewed in my favor, I'll just leave it be. Why, why play games with it? Uh, so yeah, great company. They've got some hedges rolling off uh, as of the end of this year on gas. So if you believe ACO is gonna be strong next year and this company produces, I think 55% gas out of their portfolio. So 45 or 55%, it makes a pretty decent impact going forward. So um, yeah, yeah. Great little operation. So can you share your three least favorite uh, mid cap names? Yeah, I don't really have a least, least favorite. They're all gonna do well, but I think any company that's over $80,000, $100,000 of flowing barrel, um, headwater, gear. Yeah, even Cardinal, I don't really like Cardinal, but maybe I should. I should look into it further. It's more of a personal vendetta against their 10 VPs. Uh, but yeah, I don't really have a least favorite. I, I think those would be the ones that are overvalued in my opinion. Uh, other than that, I think they're all, they're all pretty solid going forward.
not investment advice. Uh, my this is just my opinion. Uh, when will I three be a one dollar stock? Uh, one dollar stock would mean you need to value it at roughly two billion two billion dollars ish. So if they hit a good North Sea drill, like something that comes on at pretty significant rates, I think you'll see it right away. You'll, you'll see it hit a dollar in that day, that day when the news comes out, if they hit a pretty decent discovery because the pipelines to that area are, I think already built, it's not that far. So they can get it on production right away and they would be at 30, 40, I don't know how many thousand barrels a day plus their Canada growth. Yeah. Yeah, 40, 50,000 barrels a day could easily be worth $2 billion, um, especially if, if ACO holds up. Uh, so is Vermilion held back a bit by the Ireland acquisition? I don't, I don't really think so. And if it is, let it be. Um, I'm, I'm still gonna buy it. I bought my options way early and uh, just gonna leave them be because it's gonna close before December anyway, which is when my options expire. So. Um, no worries at all, yeah. Uh, two comments, just to confirm something I thought you heard. Uh, Endeavor is a public reporter. Oh, maybe, yeah. Obviously I'm uh, uh, lagging on my shale, uh, shale information, but, but Endeavor could possibly be a public reporter and that's why they have quarterly results come out. Uh, but I don't think it's a publicly traded stock, to be honest. It, it could be a public reporter, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for clarifying. Uh, Rob, uh, what do you make of IPCO? Um, it's steady Eddie. I think if you told me, uh, you know, hey, Shabam, uh, I'll give you 10 times margin on your current portfolio and uh, you just got to leave it there. I'm not going to margin call you if the stock drops, but you can only look at the stock in five years and you have to leave the money in. I would buy IPCO. I would put every single dollar I have because I know in two, three, five years, um, they're making so much money already and they might sanction BlackRock. They have the money to, to fund it out of free cash flow, and they're buying back shares at some aggressive rate. Like, oh, it's just amazing what they're buying back. Uh, so that supports my share price. And that's all I really know about them. BlackRock is not that expensive. They can fund it out of free cash flow and they can add about a billion barrels, I think, of 2P reserve. Uh, they only have what, 150 million shares outstanding. So yeah, solid, solid as can be. You can't bet against a Lundin uh, company, but the, the only one thing I would say is they might issue shares on a aggregation of the Lundin portfolio. They have Shamaran in Iraq, in the Kurdistan area, which is not really doing well. It's suffering from being a standalone entity. They might issue some shares of IPCO and merge it into that. And you, you will kind of know this is coming if they don't cancel the shares and they start building them up in the treasury. So hint, it's kind of happening already uh, to some extent. Uh, I really appreciate the questions. I do want to end this here uh, shortly, so I'll, I'll take a few more here. Um, any thoughts on Journey? Yeah, like um, love the acquisition. It doesn't fit my portfolio the way it is. It's too similar to a surge, uh, which I already have as my largest holding in both my portfolios. So I wouldn't look at it, but I think it's great. I think it's great. They're doing, they're actually capitalizing assets, uh, solid. Uh, PPR dues coming from QC government. I wouldn't bank on it. I don't think they're going to get, get very much uh, to significantly impact the company. And it's just going to get dragged in this, you know how lawsuits and courts work. It, it just takes forever. Uh, so I wouldn't bank on that as being your investment thesis on Prairie Provident. Uh, Headwater, yeah, it's just too expensive. I don't like their, their wells. It's, they're not as good. If I really wanted a clear water exposure, I would, I would buy Baytex, especially if they sold their Eagleford. I think Baytex, even with the hedges, their, their clear water is just too good. 
I do have Obsidian with their multilateral potential. Um, maybe look at Rubellite, possibly smaller, earlier on its growth phase, might be able to get some deals there. Uh, any updates on Westcan? I don't really have any updates. I haven't been following them. I know the, the shares come open as of August 1st, so Monday slash Tuesday, because the markets are closed in Canada. Um, I don't expect there to be any change. I, I don't expect anyone who participated in the placement to dump shares. Uh, I think they have the casing secured is, is the latest I heard. And the drilling was supposed to be like right away, but I've been hearing that for a little bit. They did come out with their financials yesterday evening. So a boss, if you haven't seen those, uh, check those out. Uh, nothing really in there of substance, but I think they were busy working to get these financials done uh, before they could really focus on the drilling uh, side, side of things. Thoughts on Obsidian? Um, if there's one competitor who I think can beat Surge in performance over the next 12 months, it, it's gonna be Obsidian. And I am pretty disappointed that I didn't pick up more on this recent drawdown. But my portfolio with the way it was set up uh, just was in a, in a tight spot there and I couldn't pick up more. But I think if there is a drawdown on some sort of deal or some whatever, um, I think this could end up being a much bigger weight in my portfolio. So I really like the growth that they've done here in low decline conventional assets and the rewards are not gonna be here until 2023 great, I'll front run that all day long. Something like that, I will front run that all day long. I'll buy right now, sit on it for six months, wait for the production to throw off free cash flow, make my money and enjoy. Uh, yeah, Reiko, for sure, feel free to reach out anytime. Um, Aventive earnings, yeah, that's one, that's one where the investment case is pretty clear. They're making tons of money the hedges are absolutely railing them right now. So if you have a long enough time frame, you believe in the gas, natural gas play, longer term of Intivia. Yeah. Uh, gas names make sense here. Yeah, um, I'll leave that up to you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into oil versus gas. Um, keep in mind, some of these companies like Whitecap, 25% of their production is gas. So Something that, that was making no money is now making $30, $40 of BOE net back, $20 of BOE net back. It ends up making a pretty significant difference. Uh, Whitecap also, their, their hedges rolled off at the end of Q2. We have about 100 million of extra free cash flow coming in on a yearly basis just from those hedges rolling off. Um, it makes a difference. It makes a difference uh, for sure. Yeah, I do think we're going to see more M&A going forward. I think uh, there was a big valuation gap that came in because sellers wanted one twenty dollar valuation. Buyers were willing to only pay $70 valuation. Those are never going to meet. But now we have buyers willing to pay 80, 85, sellers wanting 95, 100. It's a lot closer. You'll definitely see more deals. Um, I don't think companies are going to privatize themselves. They'll never get the share support. Like if a crew went out and said, we're going to privatize at $5.50, they're never going to get enough people giving their shares in uh, at those sorts of pricing. So just my opinion. Uh, depletion never sleeps. Yeah, C CPG. Yeah, CPG has really done well. They've done a complete 180 on their messaging. And I got to give them... Lots of kudos, credits for that. They show on their corporate presentation, $100 WTI. Yeah. When, I, when I'm discussing Crescent Point with somebody, they're not as familiar about oil. I say, go look at the corporate presentation. I want them to see 80, 90, $100 oil. Not 45, not 65, not 70. Unrealistic, unrealistic asset, um, commodity price environments. Uh, and you know what? If you don't agree with me on that, that's totally fine. I will take the other side all day long, all day long. I believe these corporate presentations should reflect 80, 90, 100, maybe 120 even. 
not right now, but as the SPR ends, as the cycle goes on, um, definitely. Uh, Enter Plus, I don't follow Enter Plus that much, to be honest. It's 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 too Bakken focused. It's never it's never got me interested ever. So I would be making up stuff now if I talked about Enter Plus here. I I just don't have interest in this company. Um, people tell me they have the best Bakken acreage. Uh, that's 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 not very good. Uh, that's like saying we got we have tier five Permian. That that's kind of what you're telling me. So yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. A dollar is only one billion cap. Okay. I thought I3 had two two billion shares outstanding, but if it's only one billion, yeah, like this. Um, there's a reason I'm I'm holding on to this uh, I3 energy. I've, I've I've been really tempted to sell, take my gains off, but I said why? I'm getting the dividend. There's a lot of interest from UK investors, Canadian investors, and OTC, I think, as well. And I have the North Sea free upside. Why should I sell right now? So I think results will be right away, like maybe two weeks after they get the first production. Um, neutrons, mountain effect. Um, not much. I think not much. It's, it keeps getting delayed. So there's that problem. And B, we have ample pipeline capacity anyway. I, I, I don't see it being a huge material impact. It's going to basically be good, good just a general basis, but I'm not going to invest based on Trans Mountain coming online at a certain time. Uh, yeah, boss, thanks for joining in for sure. I will, I will let you know uh, definitely if I'm in Vancouver. Uh, yes, I will be covering ROK after Q2. In fact, I have a valuation session coming up. Uh, I'm moving into my apartment next Friday, so you'll have to bear with me here for a couple of weeks while I get everything done. Um, it's been fun ordering furniture and matching colors and all this. A little bit different to the research I usually do. Uh, so uh, just been a little busy with all that stuff, but I will be doing a valuation session on ROK and a couple other junior companies uh, mid-August, maybe mid-August. I think 13th is a Saturday, August 13th. So yeah, um, oil field services and offshore. No, I'm, I'm still not interested. They're just not making money. Um, the big companies are not making money. I did add a frac sand supplier at the Basque Minerals and a pump supplier in the Powder River Basin, a divergent energy services, both micro caps, very small. They have pricing power in what they do. They have equipment and assets that are worth more, way more than what the company trades at. And they have long-term contracts on what they're trying to sell in a growing field. That's what I want. I want localized pricing power based service companies. I don't want the big companies they are gonna get absolutely trashed with internal inflation. Oh man, the labor, the training, uh, refixing up their equipment, ordering new equipment, maintenance. Um, Grand Prairie, if you wanna get oil changes on your truck, just a regular truck, it's like 200 bucks an hour at the Ford. What are these companies paying their people to do maintenance on these units? On top of that, I, I have concrete evidence that ENP companies that want labor, they want uh, operators, they want field guys, et cetera, they're basically poaching people from service companies because it's easier for them to pay these service company individuals more than to go out and hire somebody from Calgary or somebody who's never worked labor or somebody who doesn't have their safety tickets. The people in the oil field services side, they already have safety tickets. They're used to working 24 hour days. They're used to working six months in a row. They have the labor kind of background. Um, they know the industry, they know pressures, they know the dangers. And I know Crescent Point's hiring people. I know Spartan Delta is hiring people. I know these companies are hiring people from service companies. It's another problem because either you got to pay them more, way more, which adds to internal inflation, or you just lose them for free. Both are not good and too many unknowns. If somebody came and said, hey, I have this uh, 
drilling pipe supplier in Southeast Saskatchewan. And they sell to Crescent Point and Whitecap and Saturn and all this. Uh, do you want to buy it? Yeah, I'm definitely interested in localized pricing power where I can get outsized returns. I have a crew that works. It, most, in most cases, it's the owner that runs the company themselves. So they've got a tight crew. They're not going to get lured in by higher salary somewhere else, higher day rates. Um, sign me up. Other than that, uh, no. So long answer to your short question. Um, no, I'm not worried about the market cap of Surge. It's it's uh, totally good. Um, I think it's actually a good thing because as they get to a billion, I get that extra funds coming in. Uh, first, they hit a billion Canadian, then they hit a billion US. Funds will come in. Um, Surge obviously is known as a marketer company. Whatever your opinion is on that, it doesn't really matter. The point is they get themselves in front of investors and they prove that they're gonna produce the free cash flow. They have the assets to back it up and they have the performance to back it up. So if they're getting out in front of more people, great. Um, that's great as a legacy investor. Uh, yeah, for sure, no, thank you. And yeah, Banka, I am into small companies. I've been looking at junior companies more and more. Finding most of the stuff is, is just complete garbage, um, misleading manipulation, lying about type curves, lying about how much money they have. Uh, yeah, and I'm not gonna get suckered in. You know, these companies, uh, I've even been seeing ads talking about uh, the next oil boom is here. You should invest in working over these wells and, and make a 500% rate of returns, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, people are actually gonna get suckered into these things, but I, I look at every thing I can, Go into Petro Ninja, I can look at the details, I can look at the wells, I can look at the acreage. So I feel like I have an edge in a way. And I've only found three or four worth investing in. And over the last three months, I found nothing. Nothing good has come on my desk. So yeah, nothing good that competes with public market equities. Put it that way. Anything on the private side as well. Yeah, so, and yes, I will update the portfolio. I'm in a transition kind of phase here where I'm looking at adding exposure to junior companies in the names I already have by potentially trimming some of the bigger names. Um, and some of my options as well are expiring. So if I can sell them, buy more junior companies, I'm, I just don't wanna update it and then have to update it again every week. Um, and I haven't made any major changes. I just added crew energy a while back, I added Obsidian a while back. My one white cap option expired worthless and I have Grand Tierra options, uh, which could get very interesting, I think, because I have the December options and I'm very looking forward to those uh, and how they pan out going forward. Uh, Grand Tierra is a sleeper, sleeper company, I feel, um, not getting the right valuation. But again, in my opinion, not investment advice. And uh, I'll kind of end it there. Um, we didn't get to five hours. So I think a uh, really good session. Uh, kept it tight as, as much as possible. Uh, thanks again for everyone that joined. You, you don't realize how much I appreciate this. I think what started out as kind of like a hobby slash stuff that I did anyway on the side has now become kind of my lifestyle slash passion. Um, it already was my passion, but I like sharing it with people who care to listen. Um, 2014 to 2020, I was talking about, I was basically speaking into the void, into the black hole and uh, getting called stupid because I made no money in those you know, five or six years. The oil markets did nothing um, other than a couple plays that really hit good, some of the junior companies. Uh, so finally glad to you know, share, share these sorts of stuff with people who care and, and wanna listen in. So um, yeah, once again, appreciate that. Uh, and uh, Reiko, I, I have no plans to ever open an ETF or yeah, really ever monetize anything. So I, uh, I really enjoy these things more because of that. And I found better connections and better uh, back and forth um, because of that. And I no plans of ever changing that. So um, yeah, thanks again.
have a great rest of your long weekend. Everyone in Canada, in the States, we get our regular weekend. Um, and we'll catch you all. Uh, and yes, the recording is available on whitetundra.ca uh, under archived events. Um, it'll be on YouTube later today. I will try and get the Squarespace hosting working. Um, as always, a big thank you to my co-host Dirk on uh, Zoom. Always appreciate your time, Dirk. I've been uh, I've kind of ghosted you there for a little bit, so uh, we'll we'll get back in touch here uh, shortly. And so, hey, thank you for co-hosting on Twitter. Uh, for all that join on Twitter as well, really appreciate your time. Uh, Bob McNally is on tomorrow. Uh, so, hey, we'll, we'll be hosting that. Um, so look forward to seeing you all there. And if not, we're going to continue on with our Q2 earnings with the CEOs on um, uh, Twitter. Some other Twitter stuff coming up here. We got Rystad actually coming up to explain their analysis and their estimates. I really look forward to this. Uh, should be a fun time kind of going back and forth with them. And um, yeah. Just, just keep on keeping on and uh, take her easy. Cheers.